Ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Dollar Shave Club, the makers of some amazing razors. And if you've never heard of them, well, let me be the first to welcome you to the club. If you want to, you can stop buying expensive razors out of habit, and you can start thinking about joining the Dollar Shave Club today. Right now, you can try it out. And if you do, you can get the Dollar Shave Club's Ultimate Shave Starter Set, which is a mouthful, for a one-time trial offer, five bucks, plus free shipping. And after that, you can continue to get an unimaginably smooth shave as razor refills ship at regular prices right to your door as often as you want them. The Ultimate Shave Starter Set comes with a six-blade razor with a trimmer edge, two refill cartridges, and one-ounce tubes of prep scrub, shave butter, and post-shave dew. I like all three. The shave butter is a shaving aid that softens your whiskers, helps fight razor bumps, and leaves your skin feeling unimaginably smooth. But before that, I like to use the prep scrub. You use it before you shave to release and prevent ingrown hairs which will give you a closer and smoother shave. Don't let the name of the company fool you. I had heard about this company before trying them, and I was an idiot. Don't confuse dollar with value, because I tell you what, these razors are as good as anything that I've ever bought, if not better. I have gotten some amazing shaves over the past few months, and I'm actually using the uh, Ultimate Shave Starter Set. That is what they sent me. That's what I've been using, and that's what I like. Ditch your overpriced razor and join the club today with the Dollar Shave Club Ultimate Shave Starter Set for only 5 bucks. It has everything you need for an amazing shave. Like I mentioned, the six-blade razor, the shave butter, the prep scrub, and a post-shave do. It's all going to get shipped right to wherever you call home. And after that first box, the refills will ship at regular prices on the schedule that you want. Try the Ultimate Shave Starter Set today for just 5 bucks, plus free shipping at dollarshaveclub.com slash cleared hot. That is dollarshaveclub.com slash cleared hot. Welcome to the club. You're not going to be disappointed. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by DoorDash. Listen, people, I get it. There are, is, are, whichever way you're supposed to say it, a never-ending list of things that need to get done, whether it's laundry cycle, email, taking care of your kids, getting them to activities, making uh, grocery store runs. You're going to run out of room in your schedule at some point in time. Give yourself one less thing to worry about and let DoorDash take care of your next meal. It doesn't matter really what you want. If you want Chinese, if you want pizza... Maybe you got a craving for some barbecue. I don't know. But I know that there is something for everybody on DoorDash. Cool feature about it is that in the bizarre circumstances we're working our way through, you can continue to support restaurants in your community. And you can do that safely. There are thousands of restaurants open for delivery on DoorDash that need your patronage in this time now more than ever. And you can support them on the DoorDash app. We've counted on restaurants as a society for a long time, and right now they're counting on us. The dining room might be closed, but you still have an option to have it delivered right to your door with DoorDash. And that's what the app is for. It brings food you're craving right now right to your door. Ordering is super easy. You open the DoorDash app, you choose what you want to eat, and your food will be left safely outside your door with the new contactless delivery drop-off setting. Over 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia. You can support your local go-tos, or you can choose from your favorite national chain restaurant like Chipotle or Wendy's or the Cheesecake Factory. Basically, what I'm saying is it's up to you. You have options. Right now, listeners, you can get 5 bucks off and zero delivery fees on your first order of $15 or more. When you download the DoorDash app and you enter the code cleared hot. And the way I'm looking at this is it is all one word, all uppercase. That is $5 off and a zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code cleared hot. 
Don't forget, the code is cleared hot, all one word, all uppercase. You're going to get five bucks off your first order with DoorDash. So if that ad read made you hungry, now you know what to do. You can get something. You can get actually whatever you want to. And that's it on the business side of the house. Let's talk about my guest today. He is a police officer. And not only do I believe that it is timely to have people from this profession on the podcast to discuss very difficult, challenging, and trying issues that our society is facing, I also think it's incredibly important to highlight how difficult the job is and the valorous actions that are very often taken by those who dedicate their life to serving their community. So my guest today is Nick Kuwahu. He began his career in law enforcement in Redlands and then moved over to San Bernardino. Actually, there's no D at the end. It's San Bernardino. Sorry for the people who leave, uh, live there are probably screaming at me. But I digress. December 2nd, 2015, domestic terrorist attack. Husband and wife go to a Christmas party and start executing people. Leave behind an IED. As you can imagine, a difficult tactical situation to deal with. Nick was directly involved in the incident on December 2nd, 2015. And by directly involved, I mean a gunfight in the street with the husband and wife, terminating in him getting shot in the leg and then being awarded a medal, uh, a medal, a medal for heroism and valor from President Trump. And that's what I'm going to leave you with for this intro, because Nick does an amazing job of describing it himself. Episode number 146 with Nick Kawahu. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Turn around, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute, give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Have you ever done a podcast before? Never. Fuck yes. I love getting a no. hold of people on their virgin oh, journey oh, through dude, the... I'm freaking boot on this one. All right. <laughs> hold that mic in front of your face. All right. How do you say your last name? Kawahu. Kawahu? Yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's Hawaiian. You got it. Okay. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> I don't know if you can make those um, judgments or guesses in 2020. I'll probably will no, be... No, you uh, look at my skin color, you'd be a vicious racist now. I, I think I might cross those borders <laughs> by just assuming where you are actually from based off right? the sounding of your name. Right. Yeah. Um, I have many questions. Let's do it. I... <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? Because I'll fuck this up. I will let you touch on it as broad as you want to, and then we'll dive in. What, are you going to go from the beginning? From just a, an introduction of who you are. Because, I yeah. mean, obviously I want to focus quite a bit. Uh, I want to talk a lot about this San Bernardino incident because I yeah. watched it from a distance. And right. I don't think a lot of people – I'm very curious what was found out afterwards as well. How did right. they – were they able to do that? How did they have that shit? When, when, that's the stuff to me yeah. that is fascinating. And most, Yeah, most of that stuff is – has come out, yeah. I think. Well, yeah, obviously don't. And there's a lot of there's a lot, yeah, but there's a lot of stuff that I you know I had no idea. I, I don't know what they did. I know one of our guys who was a TLO. The, yeah, he goes, dude. It's like peeling an onion from the inside out. So so we'll get there, but let's start yeah. with who's Nick? Sure, uh, Nick Kwahu. I was born and raised in Beaumont, California. Um, Were your parents born and raised in Hawaii? My dad is from Hawaii. Was okay. born and raised there. Uh, my mom is from uh, Michigan, actually. So, um, born in '84, and uh, went to high school there. Grew up there. Uh, graduated in '02, and uh, signed up for the Marine Corps right right before I graduated. Okay. Um, I wanted to be an MP. Um, I was, really? What? Uh, so, what hooked you about that? Yeah. Um, my whole, fam whole family's law enforcement. And I didn't mean really hooked. like that was weird. He was like, <laughs> "Fuck you, dude. <laughs> that's normal." MPs, like, right? No, it's like I'm just. It's curious. Yeah. I, I'm always fascinated by people who know specifically what they want out of the military. Yeah, so I'm uh, my whole family is is cops and marines. Okay, um, my quite the legacy. Great grandfather. I'm sorry, my grand great grandfather. Yeah, uh, on my uh, my grandma's side, um, he was a three war marine. He was really. Oh yeah, from from World War II all the way Vietnam through Vietnam to Korea. Yep. Yep. All the way through, got out as a sergeant major. Um, so anyway, my uh, my dad and my uncle were both marines. You know, I knew I was going to go down that road 
as from when I was a kid. Did they ever try to talk you out of it? So my dad served in Vietnam. I came uh, military on both sides. My mom didn't serve, but her parents both did. Right. Uh, Army brats, and my dad served in Vietnam. He didn't have a phenomenal experience in Vietnam, as I think and most people. Most people didn't. So he did not ever promote military service, but he never, not a single time, tried to talk me out of it. No, my dad never tried to talk me out okay. of it. Okay. Did they um, uh, kind of say like, hey, this is... Hey, son, guess what you're going to be when yeah, you grow this up? Is you're going to be an 11 Bravo. Oh, yeah. No, it was never <laughs> like that, dude. Never, not once was it like that. Okay. No, it was, hey, here's the Marine Corps, and it's, it's, it was in our blood. And I, yeah. I knew what I was going to do from when I was a little kid. Knew I was going to be a cop and a Marine. Never thought of anything else. Okay. Um, never got, nobody tried to pull me out of it. My mom, you know, she she tried. Um, but I'm like, mom, there's not, come on, mom, it's not going to be a war. My and mom then, wouldn't let me play Pop Warner football because... She thought it was too dangerous. Oh. I was like, checkmate. Yeah. Let's do this. Let me go do the let me go do the most <laughs> dangerous job I could possibly do. And I think that's just what mothers do though. Yeah. They worry. Yeah. yeah. And and she did. And I remember in high school, I'm like, I need you to sign the contract, mom. I need you to sign the contract because I was her. gonna sign up at seventeen. And uh what did she do? Um she eventually came around. Yeah. But I remember telling her my senior year, there's not gonna be a war, there's not gonna be a war. Two thousand one. I'm the yep. senior in high school and it kicks off. Yeah. yeah. Different world that you entered, uh, I actually really am thankful for my pre-9-11 time because I got to experience the military before yeah. it... Ramped up. Before it ramped up because then when it ramped down, I had some context. I yeah. could say, oh, oh, this is what... you know." People come in in the early to mid-2000s, They it was more in the very kinetic, very deployment-centered yeah. phase, and they knew they were coming into that, and then when that tapered off, they're like, this sucks. And guys are coming in and just immediately getting out of their MOS school and getting right into a workup to deploy. Correct. You know? And then when it turned the faucet turned off, they didn't enjoy the military anymore. Right. Because it became the actual I'm not gonna say peacetime military, we're certainly still at war. The deployment cycle slowed, the kinetic targets slowed and people yeah. were just like, you know what? I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, there's no more bad guys to go after, so I'm Pretty out of much, here, right? Yeah, or they weren't getting the chance. You know, the the bad guys were so disaggregate that uh, you know they weren't they weren't at a unit where they were getting the chance to go and pursue those people and Yeah. It's because they don't now, realize they're right here at home yeah. sometimes, too. Yeah, you had a little taste of that. Exactly, right? Because <laughs> I found out very quickly. So how was your? How long did you serve in the Marines? Uh, I was in for four years. So to be an MP in the Marine Corps, you had to be 19. So Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what that, uh, that extra year of uh, adulthood gives you at 19 years old. But yeah, I wonder what Yeah, we had is. to be 19. So I, had, I signed up right before I graduated, and uh, I got my... I got my date, so it was January '03. So I had to wait six months to go to, um, so I could turn 19 in MP school. Okay. Um, so um, pushed out from. I went to college for like six months, just a community college, just pastime. Yeah. But went to boot camp in '03, and you know, never looked back. And never, never looked back. Where's uh, the uh, MP school for the Marines? Fort Leonard Wood, in Missouri. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Destination location, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think there's one strip club outside the gate. You would never go hotel. there, of course, Absolutely though, right? not. It's, I believe they're called nope. an establishment for gentlemen. There you go. Well, yeah. guess, you know, being an MP school, we only had Liberty, I think, week eight out of nine. I oh, think really? we actually got to go off base, and then there was nothing to go to, so you just came right back. I feel, I don't know why, but I feel like nine weeks, I mean, MP, we probably should unpack that it stands for military police. I feel like nine weeks is short. You know, we did a lot. It was it was split between PMO duties. Wearing, What's PMO mean? Uh, Provost Marshal Office, okay. right, I believe. Um, yep. So the guys who were driving around in the police cars on base, mm -hmm. which has since been turned over to DOD police. Yeah, they outsourced that. Yeah. Um, and then the other a majority of it uh, was, was uh, field MP work. Okay. EP, EPWs and stuff like that. Were you guys diving in deep to... Actually, you probably wouldn't need to be incredibly familiar with the UCMJ, right? Because that's going to be handled at the JAG it level. Was, I mean, if you're working PMO, then yeah. you needed to know. Okay. Um, but I mean, Basically, it, was, it, was just, it was basic, basic stuff. Okay. You know, like any other job, once you get into where you're at, you're going to, you know... They gave you the... FTO, uh, essentially. They gave you the it. open book, and they're like, hey, you'll learn the rest of this later. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. You need to look it up. Just go ahead and look it up. Yeah. Kind of thing. Okay. Fair but, enough. Um, so, yeah, we did, a lot of, we did a lot of field MP stuff out there. Did um, you stay out there, or where did you spend your four years? So, 
I had orders of 3rd Marine Division to be a field MP, so I was going off to Okinawa. We had overseas shots, and then we were ready to go. I that was orders. my first deployment was to Kadena Air Force Base in oh, Japan. Yeah. yeah. It was, did you, like did it? you end up going? No. So check this out. Because you I didn't even, dug it. Yeah, I didn't even know that uh, – I didn't even know about this unit, but uh, there's a unit called HMX. It's Marine Helicopter Squadron One. Yeah. So the White Tops Presidential. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, up in DC. Yeah. Okay. So guess where I went? I got sent to HMX. No way. So I was. They're based right uh, near Dulles, right? You see the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not Dulles, but uh, Reagan Airport. There you go. Yeah, you can see it on uh, like short final. If you look off. Yeah, if you look off, you can see the hangars. Yeah. In okay. The tower. Yeah, I know exactly where you were. So yeah, we had two two spots. That that spot's an alert facility. That's kind of the uh, go mission if the president's in town and we got to okay. push out. You're gonna go. You're gonna go over to the White House and pick them up. Oh, that's cool. Did so, you get to go over to the White House? Yeah, we did. We did a lot, you know, a lot of test runs and stuff like that all around D.C. But And this was, uh, so this was 03? This is 03, yeah. So I went over there in like August of 03 I got Who there. That the hell was in office? That was Bush. Bush. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I ended up over there and uh, initially you go to, down to Quantico. So you're down in Quantico and it's kind of like, I would call it the garage, essentially. It's where a majority of the helicopters are. Um, so you're just standing post, dude, you know. Interior guard and because uh, they're level three assets. Those are long hours. Yeah, twelve on, twelve Those off. Are long. <laughs> <laughs> Standing in a hangar with uh, with helicopters and it's restricted area and stuff. So I've talked to a few Secret Service agents who describe the early on duties as you are making your way t- closer to the principal and your protection detail. It's like this is my dumpster. There yep. are many dumpsters like it, but this, this is, is mine, mine for the next 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, our facility down at Quantico, you just, you know, we had an access control point, and yeah. you're essentially security for the, the whole facility, and we have restricted area. So, basically, you're kind of waiting to get your top secret clearance while you're at Quantico. Yeah, they probably hold you there with your interim, and then yeah. right about the time you got your TS, you probably exited the military, considering it you know, takes like about it, 24 it, months. It seems like, yeah, it seemed, it took about a year. Yeah, they take a while. It took about a year. So I got that top secret, the Yankee White, and, you know, everybody's yep. right into different programs. Um, so I stayed at Quantico until I got my top secret, and then I went up to what's Anacostia, um, the alert facility up there. And But in the meantime, everywhere that the president goes, there's a helicopter there, oh, whether yeah. he's getting on it. And being taken somewhere or just as a oh, precautionary yeah. or yeah, if he needs to move. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So So four years in the uh in the Marine Corps. Yep. And at what point in that four years did you decide that four was enough? I knew going in I was just gonna do four. Okay. I wanted to be a Marine. I wanted, you know, like every boot, they wanted to serve their country. Yeah. Um, but I knew I was gonna at four years I'm okay, I'm gonna be twenty two when I get out. Yeah. And I wanna go to the academy. That's good that you had that strategy. I yeah. think a lot of people go in, they say, and there's nothing wrong with this what I'm strategy I'm about to lay out, but it it leads it to, you know, they kind of just sit on their laurels. They yeah. they are living in the military, and one thing I experienced when I got out too was not having put enough thought into what was going to be next. Right. My biggest dream was I want to go be a SEAL. Yeah. And then one day I wasn't a SEAL, and I remember and thinking, oh, shit. What now? <laughs> I've had that conversation yeah. with myself many times when COVID <laughs> hit. What now? But exactly. Trying to reinvent. But yeah, you'll see people go in and they don't know how long and they'll get to four and they're like, eh, I don't really know what or I want. Kicking wanted. around a reenlistment. Maybe well, I'll do and they it, don't maybe know what they want to do. So yeah. they get a little coin thrown their way, maybe a reenlistment bonus. So then oh, they're yeah. eight. Right. And then they're thinking about it. They're like, man, I still haven't really, you know, I don't want to take advantage of the GI Bill, but I'm going to stay in when I do it. So then they're at 10 yeah. or 12. And then it's like, you know what? I'm actually. Might as well just run, every step run out I the take, clock. Every step I take is closer to that <laughs> yeah. 20 to wake up call. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, no, I never had a, I never had a, I'm going to reenlist here. I okay. I was going to, I was going to punch out. So. so you knew it was law enforcement long-term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then were you applying to the Academy where you're still in? So yeah, I was trying to get out on terminal leave and, uh, they didn't approve it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I missed that January 07 Academy. So I had to, basically I got my DD 214 and went driving home. You know, my wife and I, we got, we've been together since high school. We got married. Um, well, I think I just picked up corporal. So like, oh five. Okay. Um, so we lived off base, which was, which nice. was nice, yeah. you know, and it kind of, it helped as far as being in the Marine Corps. Cause it's like, it's not, I'm not stuck in this all the time i can leave at the end of the day but you were adulting you know, i was adulting i was playing house <laughs> right it's uh, cool though when you're i mean i remember actually when i got my bah paperwork signed which what that's i need to what's that acronym it's I think basic, it's basic housing, housing allowance yeah basic housing allowance that's right yeah. but i remember in the seal teams you could get it when you're an e4 
oh, they let you out. And I did a little respectfully request. Yeah, my BAH there you and go. My exo signed. I was like, oh, I'm getting an apartment. I yep. was like, I'm a fucking adult. Exactly. I'm, 19 20, I'm 19, 20 years old. And the I'm, last thing I needed was an apartment. I know. I'm sorry. Where for everybody's going to come hang out and drink. And, yeah. Yeah. I would like to apologize now to the owner of the apartment that I live in. <laughs> Fuck your place up completely. I, and that's why we didn't get our security deposit back. Yeah. <laughs> you were correct to keep the security deposit. Yeah. I apologize yeah. for all the incidents that occurred there. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew it was back to Cali. All right. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we went driving out after we got my DD14, and off we went. So we came back home. Um, like I said, we, were, we grew up together. So did so does that fall into the L.A. County? San Bernardino County. San Bernardino. Okay. My geography is failing me right now, Cali. I should know this better. In comparison to L.A., where, where the hell is San Bernardino? East. East, between, okay. It's between uh, Palm Springs and L.A. on the 10. Okay, now I know exactly where it is. Where? So what academy did you go to? I went. So everybody sends their bodies around the area to the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Academy. Really? So you can be an um, outside agency. Okay. So working for a PD. Okay. Everybody goes up but to that But it's that, that collection point for the yeah. kid. So how long was that one? That was six months. That's a six-month academy. That, that's I actually you – know, that's why when you said nine weeks to me for an MP, I was like, man. But – the duties of a police officer and the duties of an MP. They mo- might both have the word police in it. I'm going to say they're probably a little different. They're they're way different. <laughs> yeah. They're way different. Having and never like, been one, I was making that assumption yeah. to let you fill in the blanks. Well, I mean, <laughs> you're 19 years old. you got a pistol on. You, and you're, what, a Lance Corporal yeah. in the Marine Corps? And you you're have gonna no go, You're going to go yeah. tell some guy that's a freaking, <laughs> a, a freaking lieutenant colonel to put his hands behind his back, you know? Yeah. Um, that's what I think they really pressed on, like, hey, you were the enforcement on this. Yeah. Um, at that point, you need to put them in handcuffs. Yeah, that's what I think. That's what I think that year was supposed to give you some sort of maturity. I, I don't think so. I, being totally objective and honest, didn't mature very much between the ages of eighteen and nineteen. Um, I think it hit thirty before I was. <laughs> I'm still waiting to mature. I think most people would say I'm gonna be uh, getting closer to my mid forties every day go. that goes on. But yeah, yeah, it's still not. Uh, yeah, that, that, 18, that I can exactly make. that yeah. eighteen nineteen. There's no way. There's yeah. no way. But I mean, it is what it is. It's Marine Corps, and I mean that small unit leadership. You you learn. I probably I'm sure you your learn. Marine Corps experience helped you when you went into the academy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. How no, was it? So, so when I got out, I'm um, trying to apply to different apartments. Yeah. And I'm trying to get you know someone to pick me up. And this is oh seven. So you know there, there's a lot of people hiring. Um, initially, I, I put myself what's called pre service. I just. I'm going to put myself there, use my GI Bill. Yeah. And they basically send headhunters up there. And they, if you're squared away in the academy, they'll they'll pick you up. Sweet. Uh, so, yeah, so I got picked up by San Bernardino PD pretty quickly. Um, so we go through the academy. And like you said, going from the Marine Corps to the academy, it was – I'm still – Still shaking the Marine Corps NCO mode, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I wasn't one of those dudes that's going to scream at everybody when I was in the Marine Corps. And in fact, when I was in the Marine Corps, I used to grab up these new guys and be like, hey, did you know that there's 100% tuition to go to school? Yeah. Like, we go on trips with the president. We're not out on a deployment. We might as well be trying to get her degree while we're yeah, here. Yeah, you got a lot of downtime for sure. Yeah, so... That, that, That's the, kind of the difference, though, too, between people who will come into the military and they're exploring that career path. I have found that the ones who come in with a desire for the after, they're all over those programs. Oh, Otherwise, yeah. later on, I mean, I know a lot of guys who you'd see them, they're starting their bachelors and yeah. they've been in for 18 years. It's yeah. like, hey, man, um, okay. Yeah, like, what do you, what do you yeah. yeah. Or like Master Chiefs, E9s, who are working on their bachelors. And it's that, that, uh, that D two fourteen's knocking, and they need to. Yeah. They just realize, oh shit, I need to get a. Yeah, and I, and I don't mean to say that they shouldn't do those things. No, I think it's absolutely. awesome they're pursuing their education. I guess my point that was, the earlier the start, the better. So for anybody oh, yeah. in the military or thinking about the military, take advantage of the educational opportunities as soon as you can. One hundred percent, especially yeah. if you're just sitting around, and you guys are just trying to figure out where you're going to yeah. go drinking that night. That's, well, the military, that's, as you can attest, will get their pound of flesh. Yeah, but you can also get a pound of flesh from the military. Oh yeah, but you have to pursue it. Oh man, that's I, one thing. I I got my AA before I got yeah. out. You know, and this none of that stuff was explained to me. It just so happens that my buddy and I were like, "Hey, do you know they have base education here?" Oh man, and we went over and we. Looked into it, and we went to Central Texas College while we were at uh, HMX. I hope that they do a better job now with active duty guys talking about all the 
the benefits and opportunities. I would hope, you know, you get to the transition course when you get ready to leave. Yeah, and they're TAPS explain- or whatever yeah. it's called, yeah. And they're explaining these programs. You're like, where the fuck, man? I wish I would have known yeah. about this exactly. 10 years ago. Exactly. And then, of course, you know, two weeks later, you're out of the military. So it's not like you're spreading that word yeah. to the guys exactly, that you right? used to work yeah. with. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I took advantage of what I what I could find, yeah. you know? I mean, that was nothing. Nobody explained that kind of stuff to yeah. us. So I took it upon myself when I became an NCO. Hey, let's tell these kids this is what's available to you. Let's let's do it. Um, so just getting back to the academy, yeah, I uh, I kind of came in with that that mindset. You know, a is lot that of kids. Is the academy that, like a nine to five? You go Monday through Friday, or are you living? It's, it there? was a mon- no. It was Monday through Friday. Um, you know, eight, nine to five essentially. Yeah. Okay. Um, but weekends? I mean, no weekends. Okay. No, killer. it's it's basically you're working your forty hours yeah. a week essentially. So you're working five eights. A lot of people don't realize that buds is Monday through Friday and you get most of the weekends to yourself. Excellent. Yeah. They're like, oh, it's 24-hour training. Like, actually, you got a lot of time to yourself. Of course, we might give you duties that you need to accomplish to perhaps chisel away at your free time as an instructor. As they did to us in the academy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But you, I mean, the weekends are off. I mean, guys would go, I mean, shit, I'd go spend, you know, some weekends at guys' apartments. There were married guys in my class, and they had out in town. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's not And this is why you're going through buds. This is why I'm going through buds. Yeah, I mean, wow. we finish up Friday and, uh, you know, go party or just I generally go stuff our faces. I remember going to the pasta place in uh, Coronado so many times, and I mean, I was underage, which didn't stop me from drinking. But <laughs> I'm yeah, sure I the statute of limitations happened. on that is probably yeah, passed now yeah, that I'm in my forties. Well gone. But I mean, yeah, we'd go stay out in town at our buddies' houses and while they were students. It's it's a I side, did not know that. It's a, most people don't. It's a no. side of the program. If you look at documentaries or movies, it's they think that it's just, just pressure. It's like being in boot camp, right? Or you're just it's stuck there. The opposite for a, of boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really it's, you know, Mondays you can get guys to quit usually. Yeah, <laughs> you just roll it in. <laughs> you're rolling in. Home they home. have a rough yeah. one, or yeah. Well, I mean, you know, at a certain point, about five weeks into the training, if you're going to quit, you've done it by that point. Right. But uh, there's, I would say, the attrition is probably more on Mondays in the weeks leading up to that. Okay. Because they're like, fuck this. I just, I just had a 48 hours. Yeah. I oh, 48 I hours of awesome, and you're telling yeah. me to go get wet and, and sandy, I'm, and I'm going to be in the go, surf. Yeah, link yeah. arms and get sandy. Correct. I'm like, I'm out of here. Yeah. And I support that because it's not going to get it's any gotta, easier. That's got to be something that they figured out early on that, hey, give them a little taste of freedom and then smash them when they come back. I wouldn't be surprised it. if it is calculated because it's be. that curriculum has been almost the same since the 60s. Yet not many changes. They're not really. The main tools are the ocean, sand, calisthenics, um, body weight, telephone poles, and inflatable boats. Yeah. You give people. I used to give people tours of the compound, and there's this big open concrete grinder, which is like a military term for a, basically a concrete massive deck surrounded yep. by buildings. And there's some uh, flippers on the ground where the students stand, and then you walk out to the beach. I'm like that was that was the tour. And people are like, what are you talking about? Where's all the high speed shit? I'm like, doesn't happen. Yeah, the most high speed tool is the ocean out yeah. there. Look right over there. On or the I'd beach. like, yeah, I'd walk yeah. into the obstacle course and they'd look around, and you know, most of the time they'd want to try an obstacle, and it's like, I'm sorry, but our tour is concluded because if you were looking for high speed whiz bang shit, nope, it's not here. It's just like, I mean, I'm assuming it's like <laughs> got to be close to the same obstacle course that we ran at MCRD in San Diego. They're all the same. If you had logs that you jumped over, if you had stuff that you went under, if you had walls that you had to scale, yeah, some cargo nets. Same thing right by San Diego Airport. You Correct. can see it from the runway. Yeah. I yeah. used to look at that all the time. Yeah. Like, you poor bastards. <laughs> and I used to look at the airplanes leaving sure and say, you, you lucky bastards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But, uh, so post academy, you finished so, up at the academy. What year are we in yeah, now? Yeah. Um, this is 07. So I graduated the academy, I think it's September of 07. Okay. So, and then right onto the streets? Yeah. Yeah, man. You hit the ground running. And I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with like San Bernardino. The city of San Bernardino. I have passed through it. At I'm best. sure. You, I'm sure you have. You can yeah. see the tire fires. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it, that place, it really sucks. That place used to be an all-American city back in the '70s. I've been told stories by older folks that they used to cruise up and down E Street, and you know, and they're old in the '50s. Like it was a great city. There's Norton Air Force Base that used to be there, hmm. and there was steel. And when those two things pulled out in the 90s... Oh, they probably just destroyed the economy. Destroyed the economy. Yeah, absolutely destroyed the economy. There's a lot of places in on the East Coast, like massive Navy bases, if those mm-hmm. things pulled out. Or like the Oceana Naval Air Station. I think it's... I mean, God, the F-18s would fly every single day. But I can only imagine the impact it would have on the economy if that stuff pulled out and went oh, somewhere yeah. else. Just gone. 
So yeah, it would auger it straight in. I mean, just like anything else, there's there was a vacuum, yeah. and it was filled when a lot of uh, a lot of LA transplants moved out there. Um, then the the housing started going down. People started moving out, um, and it just became violent. Really? Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, so my dad was a uh, as a was a police officer at the neighboring city in Colton, which is right next door. And I remember being a kid and my dad telling us and my mom, we can't go to San Bernardino to go to the mall because that was the closest one to us, which is about 25 minutes away. Too dangerous. Yeah. No, you're not going to San Bernardino. It's too dangerous. And so what did I do in 2007? I went to work for that place. So. <laughs> did you come to the assessment that your dad was correct? That it was Absolutely. Too dangerous? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew what I was getting into, yeah. obviously. I, it wasn't, I didn't stay at home until I was 21 and go to the academy. You know, it was... I knew what I was getting into and just when you hit the streets, man, you it's, there's no slowing down. How does it work uh, in that department? Do you do, I'm trying to, I mean, I know all the cops here. I talk to them all the time about this. I can't think of the term. Field it's, training. Yeah. The FTO stuff. Yeah, How long did the FTO program so, yeah, last uh, few years? Six months. That seems to be about standard six months to a year. It yeah, sounds like it's about six months. Um, so, I mean, you've gone six months in the Academy and now you're going to do another six months with another body sitting next to you in a police car yeah. until you can go out on your own. How's that first tough. shift when you go by yourself? It's, it's, you know, it's funny. I remember being out with my first phase uh, training officer and a uh, very good friend. He, I remember him, they treat you like a boot. They, they, really? and they absolutely, they should. And I think we should still, you know, they, you need to earn, you need to earn where you're at. Yeah. Um, and you have to respect going, the position yeah. that you're working into. It has to, that position, the world of law enforcement it has to be respected not only by the people that you're serving, but by the people wearing the badge as well. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, it was, good morning, sir. Walk through the hallways, and they just look at you and just keep walking. <laughs> I support that. Yeah, and I still do. <laughs> I absolutely still do. Um, but it wasn't until they, you know, have, have this guy, is he going to jump in in a fight? Is he going to be there when we need him to be there? And yeah. it was essentially. And it takes time to answer those questions. Yeah, yeah. And, you know. Without hesitation, you jump into something bad that's happening. Officer safety, number one, paramount. Yep. That was this. That was what was drilled in from phase one. Is officer safety is paramount because hands. If you can't control somebody's hands, you're going to end up dead. You know. Let me ask you this, slightly non sequitur. What kind of training were you guys getting to put hands on people? Well, I mean, you go through six months of defensive tactics. Yeah. And how well did they actually work in application in the field? Okay, well, you're you're paired up with your buddy and learning how to, you know, uh, uh, put restrain, him in handcuffs, cuff, restrain him. Yep. Okay, he's passive aggressive. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can't simulate a fight in the academy. Yeah. I mean, you can't. You can. You can, but you, you can got somebody that, actively resisting person. But sure, yeah, you're not going to get. Sure, they put him in the red man suit yeah. or something like that, and you got to get him under control. But I mean, when you're in the street and the guy's got a parole violation warrant and he's got dope in his pocket, he ain't going back. Yeah. Well, to them, they're fighting for their life. Exactly. So it, I had this uh, conversation with a guy who actually got me into jujitsu, and he was talking about how often it's it's a. I don't want to speak for him, but it could almost be a trap for the officer because you stop a car and it's routine, and you're thinking about it routine. But the person in the car has an arrest warrant and dope in their pocket, yeah, and they think that they're not going to get a traffic ticket. They think that they're going to prison for the rest of your life, and that's too very fucking different head spaces. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so that trap can be, oh, this is my first, you know, it's like basically you pull a car an hour on average, he's going to have a touch point with a civilian, get into that complacent trap. And then the next thing you know, you end up with that yeah. person. And if your brain isn't packed properly, you're going to be behind the eight ball and fighting for your life. And this is what I try to explain, especially to the new cops is one, there's don't treat every traffic stop. Like it's routine yeah. or the same right you got to come up and you got to keep your officer safety and this is where people oh i got stopped the cop was a dick and it's like look i come at a car i'll be respectful to you but i come up here until i determine i need to come back down here i'm assuming yeah. that you're gonna you you might try to shoot me so yeah. until i can just get that brief what two three seconds where you talk to somebody and fill them out and it's like okay and you come you can i wouldn't say relax but you can you can play the hand that you were dealt. Exactly. It's, I, and I'm, you know, the reason that you reached out to me is because obviously listen to the podcast. I talk pretty openly. I, I'm incredibly supportive of law enforcement, yeah. but I'm also incredibly supportive of oversight and transparency, transparency. And I wish that people could experience for themselves. I was obviously never a police officer, not a single second, but I have 
in a tactical environment had to walk up, clear vehicles, pull people out of vehicles. Absolutely. And it sucks because you don't know what the fuck is going on on that car. You're yeah. working your angles, but you're still exposed. And if you've never done that, it's hard to develop an appreciation for the person that is getting ready to do yeah. that. I get pulled over sometimes. I like the pedal on the right. There you go. And when I get pulled over, I drop all the windows, hands are on the, the steering, steering wheel, wheel. Yep. and I sit there and the cop, you know, usually they'll come around to the passenger side. They're very sneaky little fuckers. <laughs> but again, all the windows are down and I just like, hey, what's going on? They're like, do you know why I pulled you over? I'm like, obviously I was going incredibly fast. Usually they start laughing. I still don't get tickets very often because right. I sit there and I just talk with them. Because you I, act like a, a decent person and they act like a decent person back and hey, just don't do not do what you're doing. Yeah. And it's, I, I have an appreciation for that environment and I, yeah. I wish, I God, I would almost... I mean, let's be honest. There's bad apples in every community. There are some cops yep. who start here, and then they are looking for a reason to go here. So they are starting at a 10. They're looking for a reason to go to 12. You guys can handle that side of the department. It should be handled. I think those people should be absolutely smashed. But I also wish that everybody at some point in their life had the chance to go through a force-on-force -force training situation. Well, what are those What are those things called? The, uh, where you stand in front of the screen? That's what I'm saying. A simulator. Of, yeah, I can't remember what it's simulator. called. Yeah. And have, I, you ever seen, have you ever seen, like, they'll take a the yes, they'll media take through it? Yeah, and they, and they start blasting everybody. every time, right? <laughs> the guy comes out, hey, officer, bam, 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 and they drop him. Like, That's right, asshole. It's hard to make a decision like in that a split in a split second. No, yep. I, I, but imagine, though, if everybody could go at least get some exposure to that, because what's reported on the news is, of course, going to be the negative, horrendous, horrific news breaking. Yep. I'm not even going to call it, well, it is newsworthy. It's, it's not fair for me to say that but you certainly don't see on the news the amazing interactions yeah. you see the ones that went horribly catastrophically wrong and i do my best to reserve judgment until i have a lot of the facts because i've been in use of force simulators i've been in use of force situations Correct. and it sucks and it can go to shit in a second it can go to shit in a second and that usually terminates in a bad situation for both the officer or the military member in my case and the person that you're dealing with yeah. and i just feel like people would have a touch more empathy if they could experience that themselves. And that by no means is an attempt to excuse poor behavior for people listening. That's not what I'm saying. Oh, it's, I mean, but I've heard you say, you know, in the SEAL community, there's there's people that are garbage in that community. Oh, too. fuck yeah. yeah. You get garbage cops yeah. all over the United States. And the tough thing is, and I've said this before too, is if I were to go to a SEAL command and line everybody up in their dress blues, nobody from the outside world would be able to look and say, that person is a bad apple. But right. at that command, you know, goddamn well who has a shitty reputation and yeah. who has a good one yeah. so the only people that can handle that are the people who are standing on their left and right in that uniform right. and it's tough and hey, police your own police your own but it, it's also very difficult people it is, yeah it's, because well, like we're not the people will say well you're not showing us that you're policing your own so why should i trust you that you are there's that right. lack of not a lot well yeah it's a lack of trust and i get it but at the yeah. same time when the seal community polices their own Yes, we're not incredibly vocal about it. And I understand why, because it's fucking embarrassing. Yeah. Well, right? I mean, I guess the same goes for <laughs> police departments, too. And of, they're not going to put out, yeah. you know. I mean, how many times? I've seen it multiple times. You got guys that are getting rolled up for, um, you know, sexual assault or rape, or, and they're cops. And it's like, well, the psych didn't catch it. Nobody else yep. caught it. Yep. You know? There's a badge in a uniform doesn't make you a good person. Right. It's important. And, you know, I, was just, I did a podcast last night with a bunch of high-level jujitsu guys. And they have, you know, three black belts, and I got a fucking little blue fucking <laughs> mint belt, right? But the thing is, having a black belt doesn't make you a good person. Right. It's a tool, and a person who is a piece of shit could take that tool and become completely weaponized. And yeah. that's why you have to take people, even from a community, at an individual case-by-case -case basis. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't just cross the board, this is how the community is, and treat them all, you know. Yeah. Different. I tell you what, though, man, you guys are under the microscope right now i can't you know, even imagine the difficulty of doing the job in the modern era it's in my 13 years i can't believe how much it's changed my dad used to say hey the pendulum always swings i went to, yeah. he was a cop in the 80s and the 90s and he goes it always swings back and forth when did they put i would imagine one of the first things you guys had added was body cameras uh or was there steps before that to try to add you have a recorder. Okay. You have your digital recorder that you usually just, it was just on your audio. belt or yeah, it's really? your audio. I didn't even so I actually some places make it easier yeah. to help uh, notate stuff later on. Yeah, some people or some uh, departments will require you know any co public contact. You mm. know if it's pre-planned, turn it on. If you have sometimes you can't turn on your recorder when you jump out on somebody on a you know yeah. pedestrian check or something like that. Yeah, but that's essentially what was there at the beginning. And then you came know, the now, video now and the audio. Body, yeah, now they got body cameras mandatory. 
on uh, the whole time probably yeah i think you gotta you gotta turn it on when when you go same i think same rules okay uh the department i work for now we don't, we don't have them yet and i really? know that a lot of places in 2020 a lot of places do not have it because of the storage issues and how much it costs and, oh you mean the in like the sd card storage yeah oh, that okay. And uh, oh, a lot of the yeah, vault. and a, a lot of redaction for for uh, victims, so they have to go through Fair. it and basically edit it, yeah. blur out faces, things like that. Ooh, that's a full time job in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you got a limited budget. Who's going to do it? Yeah, you know. Um, but I mean, I, when did that wave come? That started coming in the mid two thousand tens. I think that's what when I figured. The body it would cam be. started coming through. Okay. Um, but I mean, a majority, a majority of people that I know that work for different agencies, they have them now. And a lot of it was the, the testing. Were they going to wear them on the lapel? Were yep. they going to, or the shoulder or the lapel or on the chest or in glasses? I mean, there's so many different <laughs> versions. You know, I, I think I even saw something with a, there's a, there's a camera I saw, uh, that mounts to your, your gun. And well, that would require you to pull it out. That'd <laughs> exactly. be an odd place to like, here's your recording device. Hey, what's up, yeah. everybody? <laughs> so, yeah, that was just another, you know, past the body camera. Yeah. That was just another thing that shows what the person's doing. Oh, I shit. saw some yeah. kind of a some kind of a video back east where some agency had it and he got into a shooting. And all you see is just what's in front of him just kind of popping up yeah, because, the, you know, every round that gets fired. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's rough, man. It's. But I do hope that at least the people wearing the badge realize that there is a huge group, and I would say it's almost the vast majority of people who are supporters of everything that you guys yeah. are doing. And they yeah. realize, you know, it's it's easy to hop on the bandwagon and say this whole system is corrupt. I completely disagree with that. Right. I do not think that defunding the police is a good idea. No. And I always have to say this when I talk about defunding the police. I know that some people just mean reallocate money. But some people actually mean... There's a lot of people pe just get rid of the Correct. police. And that is an insane concept. What an me. amazing society we would have without laws and rules, right? What has the murder rate done in New York over the last few months? It's I don't know. Up. It went up to like 100 and something percent. And I think it's up. triple digit yeah. jump. Yeah. Um, and these guys are stomping. Chicago's has jumped. You got cops that are not being proactive. Yeah. And what does that... Trans it moves right back to that Ferguson thing. That yeah, Ferguson effect is what they were calling it. Guys yeah. didn't want to be the next person on the news and losing their careers and going to jail, so they slowed down a little bit and only responded to the calls that they were required to go to. I've had officers reach out to me, and they have from a, from shit, quite a few states in in uh, jurisdictions at this point, and they have said, "I always have in the back of my mind, am I going to end up being on the news? Am I going to end?" Up? And that's not a great mindset to have. No. I mean, imagine. And you, what are you going to do? You're going to approach the <laughs> situation a little bit reserved, right? Yeah. And then, oh, here out comes a gun, and oh shit, I'm fighting for my life. Kind of <laughs> From behind the eight ball, too. Yeah, because you're coming in with the mentality of I'm going to get in trouble if I go contact this guy. Am I going to get in trouble? And and now it's on. I think the worst part about it for you guys and gals is that it's going to be like that for a while. It's the oh, yeah. mentality right now. The pendulum, I do believe will swing and I do think people will find somewhere in the middle because when the pendulum swings it's like crazy crazy moderately reasonable yeah but that's not going to be overnight no. you guys are no, going to have a tough it's going to be years yeah it's going to be years it's to the point now I don't want my boys to be cops I was you know I was going to ask how do you see people leaving the occupation I know that if there's a golden handshake involved and they want to kind of cut some of the money in their budget and this guy's got six months to a year left and the city comes up to him and says, hey, we want to retire you early, he ain't sticking around. Yeah, I bet it would change people's uh, decisions on how long, the well, longevity of the yeah. job. How long do I want to do this? Do I want to make this a career? Yeah. Do I want to shift and do something else? Yeah. And I can only imagine, you know, the military, the longer you've been in, it's the world that I came from, man, that experience that you have, the pattern recognition, the ability to teach yeah. other people. I think it was one year they had 364 guys get out and like 363 people graduated buds. They're like, ah, we only lost one. I'm like, you lost yeah. hundreds of thousands of years of experience. Yeah. Yes, the same number of heartbeats are occurring. Yeah. But it takes time. And then those guys need you, that 10 or 15 years. And if they're not willing to stay to get that level of expertise and knowledge, it sucks. Yeah. When you lose a knowledge base like that, yeah. this is what happened at, at San Bernardino. Um, you know, just kind of jumping back into it, uh, we went, the city was going bankrupt and they, they finally, I think it was 2012. Uh, but talk about a lot of people leaving. They, yeah. People just, you're talking about the department. Out. Yeah. People just yeah. started jumping out to different agencies and there was this very wide gap between new guys 
and the OGs. You yeah. Know? And in that gap is danger for not only the officers, but I would say danger for the civilians as yeah. well. Yeah. It's actually, I'd say, at the four to six year mark of being a SEAL, you are no longer a risk to everybody that is around you <laughs> to include yourself. Right. Because the, the breadth and depth of knowledge that you have to have, it yeah. takes time. Yeah. But until you can get to that point, you need to be mentored. I mean, God, I fucked up so many times. But I was always boundaried by people who had a lot of experience. And they would let me make mistakes so I could learn from them. But we're, like, we're heading in the safe direction. Right? And it's a uh, pull your head out of your ass. Don't do that again, stupid. Yeah. Did you see what you did here? Okay, but then you get it's to the that, same way. Yeah. Yeah. You get to that four to six year mark. And you're like, okay, I think I'm not going to kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I don't, please don't AD on the range. <laughs> oh, I know. But that's a dangerous place for the people around me. And then for you guys, the people that you're serving too. That's Again, it's just, this is such a... <sighs> I wish more people would sit down and have conversations about what yeah. it takes, what is required, the time involved. And none of that conversation, again, is an attempt to excuse people who are fuckwits yeah. because those people should be crushed by the system that I'm sure is already in place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't heard one cop go, that was, oh, I don't see anything wrong with the, you know, up in uh, where Minneapolis. Minneapolis, or, yeah. yeah. I don't know a single, actually, I don't know a single person who was like, yo, that looked reasonable. I'm like, cop or not. I go, that is garbage policing. For sure. Pick the guy up, put him in the back of the car. Yep. He doesn't want to get in the car, put him in the car. You could have avoided this whole thing. You know, and it, it, uh, I didn't realize when I was first asked about it that the two of those officers were like right in the early part of their FTO. Yeah. Like four, and so again, there's that gap, right? Yeah. New guy, old guy. Yeah. It's You have to get people to that. They didn't feel comfortable challenging their FTO, that, that position of, you know, we're just going to do what we're told. They're fucked. Yeah. Their career's over. Done. Yeah. Not going to be a cop anywhere in the United States. I, you know, I'll be curious to see... Somebody was talking about it. They're going to have a hard time with anything other than basically second degree because it would be hard to prove premeditation, which from my understanding is the leap to first degree. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out too. I so mean, he's going to get charged with something for sure. Yeah. But they're worried that the, the – well, the person – I think it was fucking Rogan who was – obviously he's the male Oprah, so his <laughs> says is gold. But or maybe it was somebody on Joe's podcast. But they were talking about like, you know – the city now, or people are worried that if the charge isn't severe enough, that they're gonna, the city's gonna go into flames again. Yeah. Oh, but, I can. But it has to be see that. I can yeah. too. But the charge also has to be justifiable. Like if there was no premeditation, I don't think you can yeah, hit him with first degree murder. Yeah, you can't charge somebody with first degree murder when they didn't premeditate it or have malice yeah. of forethought. I believe is what it is. I mean, don't get me wrong. I would volunteer to do to that officer what he did to George Floyd and yeah. be like, "Hey, man, this is like, <laughs> this is what you get, motherfucker." Yeah. But I can't do that. It's because then I would be in jail, and that's not the way that the system works. And yeah. George Floyd did not deserve that. And people are like, oh, I'm a criminal. I don't care about that. And like nobody deserves to go out that way. We yeah. have a system. Use the system. And I want that cop punished, but it also has to be inside of that same system. Yeah. We and exist. I, I looked at that video and I thought immediately, I go, this is that Ferguson effect right there. Nobody wants to put hands on. They, they got cameras in their face. They don't want to get in any more use of force that they yep. got. So what does he do? He's holding them down until an ambulance gets there and he ends up killing the guy. That's garbage. Pick him up. Put him in the car. It's garbage, and it, it is indicative to me as somebody who's never had their neck ridden. Yeah, I do jujitsu a block away. I can tell you, it sucks. Yeah, and if I, and there's a time and place though that I think that would be an appropriate control measure. Nine minutes is not an appropriate amount of time. No, for that control measure, and you know that the second somebody does it to you, you're like, oh fuck, get off this my neck. This doesn't feel good. Yeah, that's actually what I asked you about your. The defensive tactics, because I was curious, and I, yeah, have, that, I have interface here with the local law enforcement, and they don't get a lot of it. You know, no, the, a lot of either. Yeah, no. the guys. No, you really don't. The gym is picking up LEO members. Um, they're learning jujitsu. They're expressing that it helps. And again, I consider jujitsu to be a tool, not a magic formula. It's not. Yeah. I hear people talk about it in terms of superpowers. It's absolutely not a superpower. No. But it's, it's a another great, tool on your belt. Correct. And I wish more of them had it because you guys go hands on with people a lot more than I had actually realized until yeah. I started hanging out with them. I didn't realize the number of times that it, even if it's just, hey, partner, you know, just that range where if they you can touch them. Yeah. Guess who can touch you? Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's you know defensive tactics one on one. Don't yeah. you gonna let this guy inside your space? Yeah, no, you gotta manage your range. Yeah, get your get yourself back. But yeah. yeah, we don't. I mean, I guess they get the amount of we get the amount of defensive tactics that California Post requires us to. Yeah, and then probably past quarterly that, training. Yeah, quarterly yeah. training. I'm actually going next week. Okay. So, you know, that's just the once a year put them in handcuffs, show you know how to do this kind of stuff. I'm an advocate for going out and getting your own training. And it sucks that they have to do that on their own time. And you hear that a lot too with they have to go get their own training ammo. They get their own range time. Yeah. 
And at the same time, in the same breath, what I would say is the position and job has to be respected. And I mean, fuck, I would donate money to allow guys to do that. I created a fundraiser to try to get people into the gym and training. So it's it, great. Yeah. yeah. And I know if and cops are picking up on they it. Are. Yeah, yeah, they've sure. been like uh, 10 in the Valley so and far. Another thing with that, if you think about it, it builds the confidence in that person too. Your cop. likelihood of actually being violent is decreased. My, in my experience, the more capable and knowledgeable you are in the realm of violence, the less the likely you are to actually to engage in. Right. Well, because you know it sucks. Yeah. People forget that winning a fight still sucks. You're still going to get hurt doing yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> the best way to win a fight is like, peace out, homie. I'm not, yeah, I'm not even going to engage yeah, with I'm going to buy you another beer. You know what? You're yeah. right. You're very good looking. I'm very ugly. You're very have smart. It. I'm very stupid. Whatever I have done to offend you that you won't remember in the morning. Yeah. Let me exactly. give you a there you go. tasty, frosty beverage to <laughs> increase the lack of memory you're going to have in the yeah, morning. Yeah, right. It is, yeah. Like I said, you're still going to get hurt and yep. put your ego aside, check it, whatever. I, I agree. I don't want to go get in a street fight right now. You so know? what did your trajectory go? So you went uh, through the FTO so, and yeah. then... Uh, past that, went into patrol, um, you know, working by yourself, graveyard weekends, you know, yeah. the boots get the weekend graves. So <laughs> <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, you just, in the city that I worked, you just get so much experience so quickly because it's, you've got nice areas yep. and you have areas that require a lot more police attention. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet the ratio of calls from the... Nice areas to the areas surrounding the nice areas is disproportionate. Disproportionate yes. would be the most yeah. apt term. Yeah, and you have areas there where just this is where the homicides happen. There's multiple homegrown gangs in this area. Well, they're all beefing with each other over something stupid that we haven't even learned about yet. And now there's a guy dead over yeah, there. Dead oh, guess the where you go? We're gonna go over to the other other gang side. So we know that the car is coming back there. You know, that's the kind of stuff that you start learning really quick. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Because we know that the, yeah, we know that the bad guys are gonna come back to their area. Yeah. So So did you stay and again I, I get uh, I don't know much about the, the terms or the career records on the way, but did you stay on patrol for a couple of years? Did you move yeah. it? I mean, I know there's like homicide and detectives yeah, and stuff like so that. Yeah, so you got but, those auxiliary duties yeah. and teams that you can go to. So I spent I don't know, about four years on patrol. Um, and then I went to a proactive team. It's okay. kind of two man unit. You go out and you hit the hot spots like we were talking about. Okay. Um, and then from there I went to, and this is where I learned a lot. Uh, the next thing I went to is called like a district resource officer. You're basically problem oriented policing. So you're going, you're talking, well, you've got 30 burglaries in one area. Let's start working it and try to figure out who's doing it. Um, but then you get a lot more coffee with a cop, sitting down with citizens, things like that. And you kind of start hearing their concerns and working on quality of life stuff. I have a buddy, Paul Sharp, who is or was a police officer in Chicago, and I'm trying to remember the name of the position he held, but he lived in the neighborhood. They moved, Him and his family dropped in, I think it was for two years. Yeah, there was some, there's some programs that cities do yeah. that it's like Cop Next Door or something program or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I forget that. what it was called, but he... They essentially cut your house price down for you to live in the area or something like I'm that? I'm pretty sure he was not paying anything to live there. I think that he basically... He, you know, point being... He wanted to become a fixture in the neighborhood. Yeah. So they could be like, hey, we're going to go talk to, you know, Officer yeah. Sharp or Paul, whatever they would call him. Probably call him, hey, suck up, or whatever. They're, they're, <laughs> he has some colorful terms that he said were thrown his way. There you go. But at the end of that, you know, he could, he knew the people. He could have an interaction that you're not going to have if you're cruising by and you're black and white yeah, and people sure. are just turn their back and go the or, other direction. Or flipping you off as you drive by. Yeah. Oh, he would do that. <laughs> Nobody would ever. Nobody do that. would ever give you the one. The finger. one finger salute. Yeah, <laughs> never. You're number one. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So I I went to that uh, pop position, and then from there, um, I started working narcotics. I got into narcotics. So let me take a stab. Cali, San Bernardino. I'm gonna say meth. Dude, it's everything. It's everything. Because <laughs> you got to think about the corridors that are coming through those areas, right? What oh, you're we, right what at are the we, beginning of it. What are we, 90, 90 miles away from the Mexico border? Yeah. So you got the 15 that comes up through our area. Yeah. You got the 10 that leads to the west or to the east. Oh, shit. I mean, yeah, you, you guys got, are probably a major artery for that yeah. stuff. So, I mean, it's it's all over the place. So Talking to the guys here, I think they said the source cities are Seattle and there's another one. But it's that due north, you know, yeah. from Cali. Yeah, and it's farther north you go, the more expensive it is. Yeah, they're saying a lot of this stuff comes from Mexico, and we are sitting here right now about 66 miles from the Canadian border. Yeah. That is a long path yes. for it to take. So it, just imagine how much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when so when I first started dope in 2013-ish, it was like $4,000 a pound for a pound of meth down there. 
there's so much meth now before this COVID stuff. It was down to like a thousand dollars a pound, eight hundred bucks a pound. There's just so much that's here. Wow. If that, you know, put that in a little bit of perspective, that price and it's jumped up now because they're having a hard time getting it across. Yeah. I, man, have you seen a large percentage of people that have been able to get off of that particular drug? I haven't heard. I guess what I'm saying is I haven't heard a lot of success. I don't know a lot of success stories. Yeah, there are some, Um, you know, I guess in the mid 2000s, they started seeing uh, Oxycontin, the pills. Yep. And a lot of kids were starting to use it. Well, then when those became too expensive, they started turning to heroin. You know, yeah, because it's a, they're both a they're all opiate, opiate. Right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the over prescription I've heard led to a uh, in a drastic uptick in the heroin use because yeah, pendulum over prescribed. Yep, cut it off, but you got addicts and they're like, well, Going ten dollars a shot. Here yeah, we go. Yeah, exactly. So we saw a lot of that, um, especially in like the more well off areas. A lot of the kids really? were using their parents' pills, and then they became heroin addicts, and it sucks. And you see them, in, you know, where I work now, you see, you know, I know a kid that his they have several million dollar house on the south end of the city, and he's a heroin addict. Fuck man, you know, crazy. I w- God, I wish. Yeah, I just I don't I have not heard tales of success on getting. I'm sure there are. But yeah. in comparison to the number of people using, it's single-digit success rates. I mean, I think personally people probably know that, but as a police officer and going seeing this person all the time or arresting them for drugs, yeah, they're not going to come back and tell me that they're clean now. It would be nice if they did. Your only indication you would only probably— only see them is when they're screwed up. Yeah. I mean, maybe your only metric or litmus test would be you stopped seeing them. Yeah. But hopefully that's not because yeah. of an overdose. Yeah, maybe you're wondering where he went. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the number of— uh, I call them repeat offenders. I'll ask the guys who I roll with. I'm like, so yeah. how many repeat offenders do you see every day? And they're like, eh, 70%. Yeah. It's the same guys, <laughs> same guys, same guys. Yeah, exactly. Which also, God, would I can only imagine drains the patients and mentality and make you feel like you're in a hamster wheel. Yeah. I mean, think about it. California, with their laws and things that they've passed, has made – this started with the uh, prison overcrowding in like '09. Yeah, and they started letting prisoners out of state prison back to the communities, and now probation's picked up their caseload. And then they passed the Prop 47, which was no. Uh, they took violent felonies and dropped them down. Really took the word "violent" out of some of the categories, um, and these are the only you know set of of crimes that are going to be state prison worthy. They dropped possession of drugs things like that down to uh misdemeanors they drop the uh they up the price of like um grand theft it used to be like 400 bucks they jumped it up to almost a thousand dollars so huh. everything under that's a misdemeanor so what we were seeing and i saw was this this like you said revolving door revolving door because you just give them a ticket now guys that used to go to jail for felonies are now getting a ticket and then what are they doing they're screwed up on dope now the property crime's going up because they're starting to steal stuff. Yeah, and they're not in jail where they can't steal. It's it's it's. A I mess. don't know how to fix this. Uh, I don't have a solution for that at all. No. How to fix that? Way yeah. past my knowledge base. For sure, I have no idea. None. So, what year was the San Bernardino event? This was 2015. Okay, December so been, 2nd of 15. Okay, you'd been at it for a while. How did your How did your day start that day? Uh, let me see. What were we doing? Um. We were following some guy down to L.A. We were looking for a guy. Oh, so you were working drugs still? Yeah, okay. yeah, still in narcotics. I mean, I was driving a sweet mom van, driving my caravan, had my chocolate lab that was our, our hey, drug dude. dog. I had a Honda Odyssey for a long time. Ooh, that shit was bitching. Sexy. Multiple <laughs> locations for cups. There you go. Sweet DVD in the back. Sound system wasn't bad. Press a couple buttons, doors open That's up by themselves. You can have an assault team in there and it's like, <laughs> deep, hit the button and those things go open and you're flying out of that thing. Yeah. Honda Odyssey kind of rocks, actually. There you go. I think I've been in the back of vans or a react team where we just pop the doors and here yeah. we, out we Fuck come. Yeah. yeah, so no, I had my, uh, I had a canine. I had a chocolate lab. He was just a drug dog. So he he had the whole third row to himself. So. Awesome. He's living his best life. He was living his best life. Exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, we went out to L.A. We were following this guy. We were trying to find a phone. Um, and we could see the phone ping is starting to come back towards our area to the yeah. east. And as we're coming uh, down the freeway, we had a, a lady in our office. She was our, our work mom, excellent analyst, intel analyst. She uh, she says, hey, you guys need to turn your radios on. Something's going on. Because most of the time on our car radios, we had just like a, a – 
talk about channels. Like um, Motorola, basically? It, yeah, essentially. Just off of repeater tower, yep. things like that. So we switch our, our car radios over, and you can you can hear some shits going on. Yeah. Uh, you can hear it in voices. I mean, yeah. guys you worked with that long. Yeah, you, you can go, hear it in their tone. You can hear tone. their voice. Yep. Yeah. This isn't good. So um, so we broke. What was the re- initial report that came out? Do you remember? So, yeah. They, uh, the initial came out as a, a shots heard call okay down at this place so the inland regional Sounds center, reasonable yeah. yeah it was an inland regional center it's essentially where they help people with disabilities things okay. like that it's a county building um so there was a, the group of um of county employees are having a christmas, christmas party, party slash yeah. um training session uh, just a day to go over videos and things like that, and then they're going to have the Christmas party. That the the man was involved with them somehow, right? He was part of that group. He was. Oh part yeah, he of worked group. with them. Okay, that's right. Okay, oh, yeah. I mean, there was a he worked with them, and uh, shit. I think they said they even threw a baby shower for him a couple months before that. Yeah, nice, right? So, um, so we hear that that shots heard. Shots heard. Then it turns into a shots fired. Then it turns into an active shooter. Dispatcher saying that there's somebody inside shoot actively shooting right now from a law enforcement perspective when that comes over the radio is that basically lights and sirens all drop car, whatever the hell you're doing in and that get, direction get your ass over there as okay. fast as you can our probably every officer yeah, that heard that radio you want to know a lot of the training that we got especially after a lot of the school shootings unfortunately is we have a lot of training in active shooter yeah ton of training well you gotta shooter. you gotta play the hand that you're dealt yeah so it's a hey. Sometimes you don't have time to wait for a yeah. four-man formation to go in. You, you you're the first one there. Get in there. Stop the threat. Okay. So, so shots heard, shots fired, active shooter. Yeah. Every cop car probably in a fucking hundred mile radius. Yep. Just lights and sirens, full speed. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, what he does is he was actually in the meeting. He they said he was a little weird. Then he just everybody starts looking around like where'd he go? He's not here. About fifteen minutes later. Comes back through the doors and starts shooting his coworkers. What did he go in with? What was he gunned up with? They both had AR-15s and they, they both had uh, drop-down holsters with uh, pistols. Okay. Was he wearing like a chest rig for magazines? What was yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He basically had an LBV on. Okay. Um, it's a load-bearing vest for people listening. Yep. Yeah, and that just filled with ammo. And do you know how many mags he went in there with? I don't know. I don't know. They had a substantial amount of ammo at the end of this. I'm assuming he was following the California laws and only had 10-round magazines. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Good <laughs> law-abiding citizen, for sure. I bet you he had. He's probably packed full of 30-rounders. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so he basically walks in, and they start mowing down people. You got employees trying to run and hide. And she was not there, though, yet, right? She busted in with him. Basically, okay. essentially, he disappeared, and then they linked up, and before they went in, they basically pledged their allegiance to whatever asshole's name is for ISIS. Yeah. Did yeah. they post a video as well? No, I don't think they. I had thought a video. that for some reason I thought that was their that was their pledge of allegiance to him was. They essentially sent him a Facebook. We pledge our allegiance to Dickbag. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, they go in there shoot for I don't know how many uh, under a minute. Mm-hmm. But this is where you know talking to the guys that that came in there. Yeah, he hit a, uh, a fire. Uh, the sprinkler system started coming on, and the lights are going out. And this is all the kind of stuff that we, tr- like down to a T, what we had trained for. Yeah. What guys didn't train for is having to step over people that are grabbing them and begging them for help. Yeah. And they have to shrug them off because they're the first team in there, and they've got yeah, you have to fight. neutralize the threat first. Yeah. So essentially, we didn't. There, it was unknown if they were still there. Uh, by the time the first, the, essentially, what happened was by the time. Our first units arrived, which was uh, a couple motor officers and a lieutenant. Okay. Um, and a patrol guy. Nobody had a rifle on the team that went in. They had a shotgun and pistols, which is, I don't really want to go gun to gun with a pistol versus a rifle. Or a shotgun versus AR. That's <laughs> yeah. not an awesome deal. So right away, they're, they're under arm going in there. How long did it take them to get there? They got there within a, like three minutes. Okay. I mean, very. It was very quick. And the man and woman were already. Basically, detached. they came in on you know one side, and they ran out, got into their SUV, and they left. Okay. Um, so they just missed each other. Oh. Okay. So, essentially, you got dead, wounded people laying around. There's blood and water, you know, in the water puddle. It still smells like gunpowder. You know, this is you know getting this from the guys who actually went in. Yep. Um, what they did is, 
the guy left a, an IED on the table, left his bag behind. And we since have video of them going up the street, making a U-turn, and trying to come by and clack that thing off. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so it had a limited range. So crazy because you see them coming up the street and you see a unit fly right past them, flying right past them. We didn't. Obviously, of course, they yeah, didn't, didn't know. know. It was, yeah. yeah. But what they did is they spent the next however many hours trying to get as close as they could to the IRC to set that thing off. What was the IED made of? <sighs> it was a pipe bomb. It was hooked up to, uh, I think he got it right from Inspire magazine. Really? Yeah. Because we would see guys overseas trying to use uh, like garage door openers. They had Limited. it hooked up to a uh, yeah. little race car. Interesting. Yeah, I'd also see like they do key fobs. You, oh, right. They would want you know what I mean, like the range that you could click a button and yeah. unlock your car, shit like that. Right, right. Yeah, they which is a, not far. It's had, it's less distance than people that, think. 30, yeah, and then you put it inside of a building. That's probably what saved it from going. Essentially, off. they hooked it up to a shit remote control car. Yeah, and then and put some concrete in yeah. shit that would stop the radio waves. Right. Yeah, and it didn't go off. So basically, they were trying to take out the first responders that were, they knew were going to come in, and they purposely left it up high yeah because they learned that when you put stuff down low and it just was looked like a backpack yeah i think it was just like a bag just a regular bag that he had come in with um so unbeknownst to the guys making entry yeah they didn't know there was a bomb sitting right there and as they're moving through i think it was shit i was probably there by the time i heard one of our lieutenants say hey we have a suspicious device that needs to back out yeah because they're still trying to clear this this building in this complex of buildings looking yep. for these shooters just in case somebody's laying in wait and i'm sure that there were probably wounded people in that room with the ied that needed medical care Absolutely. so yeah that becomes a very complex yeah i mean just chaotic right yeah. how do you how do you control that chaos you had guys that were throwing people on office chairs and rolling wounded out and basically trying to pull ambulances in and sometimes those guys don't want to come in if it's not clear or if it's not a scene or if there's secure. a fucking bomb on the there's table bomb, yeah so they're they've got officers running next to these ambulances to give them security yeah and they're basically i mean it was like all hands there's probation officers rolling up with f-150s and people getting thrown in the back of trucks and now they're trying to set up a how casualty. many people were injured what was it i think it was 36 in all and 14 died okay but here's here's where the little miracle starts so if there's a silver lining in this where we're at in San Bernardino, we have Loma Linda University, which is a trauma center. We've got Arrowhead Regional, which is a trauma center, all within a three to four mile range of where this is happening. Yeah, higher levels of care. We have two lives. other hospitals up on the north end of San Bernardino. So you ring, you're ringed by immediate care, you know? And what is it, that that golden that golden hour or the 15 minutes? Or? They call it the golden hour, yeah. If you yeah. can get somebody, I mean, dude, for us overseas, it's slap tourniquet get yeah. to higher level of care right immediately yeah. you're calling somebody in get them out stop the hydraulic fluid from leaking yep. to the best of your ability and get them i mean you can only do so much even in an ambulance like you can transport you just got to get them to a level you one. have to get yeah. them to an operating room for yeah. a lot of people in a ballistic environment yeah and from what i heard the there were there wasn't very many people who got transported that ended up dying very i mean one two i think is what i yeah. heard they immediately set up a casualty collection point out uh, outside of the, I was on the street, like by a golf course yeah. across the street. But I mean, you've got people just running people out and taking them over to the firefighters and they're running them to these casualty collections. So essentially everybody that came out of there, most of them lived. The people who were left in there were already dead. There was nothing, nothing yeah. they could do. Yeah. Um, so the, the second little bit of luck was our SWAT team, which is basically like a part time, they are on yep. call, regular Secretary patrol officers. Ancillary duty. Exactly. Yep. They were all together training up the, a couple miles up the road no shit so imagine how long it takes to activate a SWAT team to come in you're looking at what an hour and a half before they're actually and they were already all together they're all together okay. and they were doing active shooter training no fucking way so all they had to do was take their slides <laughs> off and put the real ones back on yeah wow yeah stupid okay. luck right so they're already on scene starting to clear the buildings yeah um how long did it take for them to realize that the i'm at you probably didn't even know it was a man and a woman at that point. or maybe At was, that point, no. Because no. you didn't know how many people there were, where they went. I mean, there's a lot of shit you guys have to that, figure out on the fly. That was one of the things. The The only piece of info we really had was there was a black SUV that left. That's all we That's all we knew. So I feel like there's a lot of black SUVs in the San Yeah, Bernardino. you know how many freaking black SUVs you start seeing after something like that? <laughs> Every single one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then, and then the shit bags start piling in. People start calling in bomb threats to hospitals. Really? Oh, yeah. People calling in. I think they might have been the bomb threats. 
super assholes. People got arrested at the end of that. They yeah, they sh- as they should. They found out. But the people started calling and just, I guess they're being vigilant and they're trying to help. But they're calling saying, hey, I saw a guy wearing uh, you know camouflage and a black SUV here. So now you've got car full, you know, basically you're, people are loaded down four deep in cars trying to just be a quick reaction force, this kind of stuff. That's and tough. Yeah, you're basically hunting needles in a stack of needles at that exactly. point. Exactly. And we have no idea where these people are. Um, so, yeah, people are getting transported out. By the time we got there, my team got there. How um, long after the shooting do you think? I'd say within 30, okay. 30 minutes or so. We, I mean, we went hauling ass down the freeway and For got sure. there as quick as we could. Um, immediately, we were tasked with intel. We're going to go, we need to start working this up, working this up. Um, my sergeant was, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go find him. Roger that. Let's go do it. Um, so we started getting sporadic information and, uh, an officer who was actually, um, his dad was my sergeant, um, comes with one of the the employees who was actually in there Mm -hmm. and goes, I think you need to look at this, this guy, here's his name, gives us the name of the actual shooter. It ended up being, okay. You didn't know that at the time. At the time. No. And this is where the, uh, the luck factor starts to come in. So all we know is we got this possible guy. We start pulling county records, trying to find out cell phone numbers, addresses, anything we can find. Um, at that point, we are we still have people coming out of the building with their hands up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So my buddy and I are running up and down the lines going, who saw something? Who saw something? Yeah, trying to get some on-the-ground yeah, intel. Exactly. Yeah. I saw it. Okay, come here. What did they What did they look like? How tall were they? Do, did you Did they say anything? Tattoos? Anything? So we're just basically taking their info down, taking a quick statement. If it's pertinent, we're passing it on. They've already set up a command post. Um, so while they get this guy's name from the employee, they start looking into it. We still don't know where these people are, right? Here's the the dumbest luck, good thing that could have happened to us. Some some guy, some citizen, he has a car basically do a weird turn in front of him. And he goes, that's odd. I'm going to remember the license plate. Remember? Shut I swear the to fuck God, dude. Up. I swear to God. He like memorized the license yeah, plate. Yeah, memorized the license plate, goes home, turns I on TV. I can't even remember my own goddamn no shit, license right? plate number. This, is, this guy's a savant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this guy gets his license plate, goes home, looks at the TV and goes, oh, they're looking for a black SUV. That was a black SUV. I should call the police department and let them know. No way so donnie our our uh, our analyst that's in working this stuff up for us like i said she's an amazing analyst she hears the plate runs it comes back to a rental car company she contacts her rental car contact and says i need to know who rented this they cut through some serious red tape and sent the sent the uh uh what a contract over yeah and it's our guy it's I a, was I was uh, watching a Netflix series on Ted Bundy. Mm-hmm. What did him in twice was stupid traffic interactions. Right. Okay, he got out of jail right. once and stole a car and did like an illegal U-turn with his lights off. Exactly. And got pulled over. And then in Florida, when he eventually got caught, it was something stupid again. Both times he was rolled up because he was in a car yep. acting like a fucking asshole. Exactly. <laughs> so... Imagine that this this guy just this guy saved the day. Wow! Gets us and it's and it's the same name that we were looking at, and now we have a new address, and now we have a new phone number. Okay. So we call the phone company. I don't remember which one it was. Yeah. Verizon or something, and say we need emergency phone ping now on this. Yeah. So, as we were waiting for this ping to come up, we kind of break off, and um, we're we're my team. We broke away uh, maybe a mile down in like a Hilton parking lot. We yep. start. Okay, where do we need to go? We got addresses in Corona. We got addresses in Riverside, which are all to the southwest of us. And we have one in Redlands, which is right next door. So we kind of come up with, all right, I'm going to, me and another guy, we're going to go to the Redlands address. Let's just go out and bird dog these places, see what we see. So as we are leaving and we're going towards Redlands, I'm like, I know how this is going to end. I know we're going to find them and I know how this is going to end. We're going to, we're going to get in a gunfight. Yeah. Um, I called my wife when I was getting on the freeway and this is kind of the thing that tripped me up later on as I called her and I said, Hey, we're going to find him. We got a ping said, I know how this is going to end. And I said, I love you. Tell the boys I love them. I'll always be proud of them. I'm glad that you had the chance to do that. And that's, yeah, 
I look at it now and I'm like, how many guys got that chance? Almost, I mean, none. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, it was weird. It's all, it's like, I knew what was coming. Well, your mortality is thrown in front of your face. It's yeah. a tough one. If yeah. you haven't lived through that, it's a tough one to describe, but it might've actually helped you do your job later on. I think so. Yeah. And I guess I'll kind you of were able in. to shelf that portion. Yeah. I went through, uh, when I was overseas, I would go kind of through a systematic approach as we would get closer. I specifically remember doing a lot on helicopters and I would, I would take the time to think about each one of my kids and yeah. You know, it's, I guess it's weird to say, but like try to Bluetooth transmit to them, like yeah, you know, like fuck, like yeah. you know, because I'm never going to get to make a call any of that stuff. And I would just, as we would get closer, I would take the time to think about them, to in my head at least say anything that I would want to say to them. I would think about uh, the wife I had at the time, do the same thing, and then just it gave me the ability to shelve that. But yeah. it was important for me to work through that because otherwise, because that's going to be on your mind. Yes, and, you and I didn't want that on there. Concentrating on your front sight. But I did right. it very systematically, and it actually it helped just by going through that. I, I wasn't able to verbalize it, but even just the thought of trying to just this Can't is what I would say a piece at yeah yeah something yeah, happens helped. yeah so yeah that's uh that was a phone call that you know I had to unpack later on yeah um so we're we we're starting to cruise to Redlands and phone ping comes up. Oh shit! They're at the address that we, the, or, it's or the, in the phone area. Is, yeah. yeah, it's in the address that we I was headed to, and it's in that area. So we basically set. I set up on point, and I'm watching it. I set my buddy up in the back, um, and we actually had one of our homicide guys come. Hey, the SUV just turned into the alley. So he was in a like a Crown Vic or something. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, get out of here, dude. Like I'm. In, you look like a cop yeah. sitting there. We're in a goddamn Honda Odyssey stop yeah, spoiling exactly. our shit. Yeah, <laughs> so, Fucking murder van. <laughs> so exactly, the murder van. <laughs> oh, So I tell my buddy, I'm like, hey, it's coming towards you. He's like, okay, I got it. We're going westbound on state or whatever. And I'm like. What authorities do you guys have at that point? So you have, it's, you think you've identified, or maybe you positively could with the, with the plates. What level of of authority do you have to stop it at that point? Can you go? You, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can stop. I mean, you can stop. Know what I mean? Like, could you go kinetic right out of the gate? Do you no. have to wait until they... You have to wait until they do something. You fuck. can't, I mean... Even if you... In your in your previous world, you could roll up next to them and just dump a full mag in there if you knew there was, a, you know, somebody in there that And you I get. have. It was amazing. But <laughs> it's... Well, I'm, I was trying to think of it from the perspective of... You know, it's been a sh there, you know, there's been a shooting. I'm always curious when it comes to the limitations that are placed on res the responders. So you know it's yeah. been a shooting, but also you'd probably have to – there's got to be a place, a point in time where you could burn them down in the car. But you'd have to know it was probably positively 100 them, them that there was nobody else in the car. Because, yeah. oh God, can you imagine like a kid in the car exactly. or something like that? Okay, okay. So, yeah, you can't just – I mean, you could, I guess you could pit them, but you can't just roll up their guns blazing, exactly. even though it was an active shooter. Okay. Exactly. We got it. We still don't know if this, I mean, the phone's in the car. Gotcha. But okay. Yep. That's that's all we really know. Yep. Okay. So we had the pictures of um, of him. I had a, yep. uh, you know, okay, I know what he looks like. Um, so we start following him through Redlands and I'm calling my, the rest of my team, like, guys, get back here. We got him. Yep. You know? And at this point though, you're following uh, the uh, unmarked so you're not yeah. you're not so you're not lighting them they up. don't they okay. don't know that we're cops behind them That's and we're still about. driving like normal people they're not driving crazy important question the chocolate lab what is he doing at this point he's probably freaking licking his ass i don't know okay so he still have the third row to himself he's hanging out back Fuck there yeah. dude i wanted to make he sure is, your buddy was there with he you. doesn't know <laughs> doing his dog things whatever Perfect. he wants to do all i know is that he he used to come through the middle and try to sneak up yep. as i'd be driving down the road and I'd be like, get out of my face, dude. All get right. back there. So he, so was he still, wasn't doing that. He was still on the case, though. He yeah, was yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, doing his exactly. duties. Exactly. Yeah. Mac the crime dog. <laughs> his name was Mac. Um, anyway, so we're following him, and we get up to a stoplight, and I'm behind him, and they, they change lanes. So now I'm door to door with him. And that was my first, oh, shit, moment. Yeah. I already had my rifle out. Yeah. What were you wearing? Just regular Civilian clothes. clothes? Okay. Yeah, regular Good. clothes, shirts. I had shorts, black yep. T-shirt, hat, essentially – what we're wearing right now. So you didn't have any armor on either. Not at that point. No. Okay. My vest is behind me in the seat, and I okay. remember pulling up next to him, and I had my rifle sitting down. And I had a little shorty uh, Smith and Wesson or a Colt or something yep. like that. I think it was a Colt, a little shorty. Probably a ten incher. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's for entries. And yeah, for sure. Like that. Um, iron sights. Yep. So I'm like, if he looks over, he's going to see a butt stock sticking up with a telescope. So I shoved it down, and I, I remember I pulled my Glock and I set it like right underneath the door. Yep. And I'm like, I looked over and I went, oh shit, that's him. 
that's that first oh shit and i could see it was him clearly but in the back i saw i'm so i'm putting this out like hey there's there's two people that i can see um it's positive id on that guy yep whoever's in the back is like slouched down real low okay nobody's sitting in the front seat sitting in the back and it's still even at this point it hadn't been identified as his wife correct okay we had no idea so they uh they continue down they get on the tim freeway and start heading back towards san Bernardino. so we're just one city over um at that point I'm not going to go from the two lane over to the turn lane. For sure. You're going to have to pass that yeah, off. Yeah, so I That's some it. day one rookie shit if yeah, you do that. Don't be burning freaking lanes all the way across yeah, the freeway. I'm not even get... a cop, and I know you shouldn't do that. <laughs> come, come on, new guy. Yeah, exactly. But so, like this minivan seems to be following us yeah. after we've just committed murder. Yeah, maybe there's something yeah, to this. It's all. It's got tinted windows, and yeah. maybe I should keep watching that. But yeah. So, yeah, I passed it off, and I'm okay. But now we need a marked unit. Like some of our cars have lights in them, but yeah. we, we, it's always preferable to get a marked police car up yeah. there just so happens here comes a redlands pd unit and i i start honking my horn and flag him down and let me ask you this did you have the technological capability to talk to him on his radio we could and a lot of that we because i have heard horror stories about cops side to side but they can't fucking talk to each other because frequencies or radios and i think a lot of the county post 9 11, I think oh. that's where it started okay. to change. A lot of the county moved to the same kind of radio system. Okay. So I guess in in theory, I could have switched over. And, okay, but it was I wasn't tunnel visioned. It was just okay. There's a cop. I'm gonna flag him down. Yeah, for so. sure. I was and it. Yeah, you, by you telling that, I was like, I'm, I'm all again. I'm fascinated and curious about the world that you work in. There's nothing worse. Like I've had it where you're with Army unit or Marine Corps unit, and we're looking at them, and you're like giving them the telephone signal yeah. and they're just giving you the yeah. what do you want I'm exactly like, fuck man i can't come we can't over talk, to you we can't talk to each I can other see, yeah i can see you and you're number one like yeah. i'm gonna go <laughs> <laughs> for sure yeah so i i flag him down and i'm i just id myself i said samarino pd i said we're behind the shooters we need help with the stop and no hesitation sergeant he was a sergeant for redlands pd um who became one of my very best friends after this he no hesitation gets on gets behind me I don't know what he's saying to Redlands PD. Yeah. We're still on a talk about channel, just a repeater channel oh, talking shit. to each other. We don't want to put it out over channel one, the main channel, because guess who's listening? Either bad guys or the media. Yeah. You know, we don't want that stuff going out. Yeah, There's for like, sure. what, a 30 second delay or something like that. But That's not still enough. not enough, right? We don't want to put this stuff out. So here I am in my uh, murder van driving freaking 110 miles an hour as fast as a caravan will go. And, uh, our guys start getting off. Now they're headed like back towards the IRC. Hmm. So essentially what they were doing, they're, they're trying to get as close as they could to try to clack that thing off. It's a really bizarre plan on their part. I'm glad yeah. that they had a shitty plan, obviously, yeah. but it, it's weird. I yeah. wonder why they went with that one. So yeah, they get off the freeway. Um, uh, my buddy Andy, who works for Redlands PD, he comes, he comes up and we put him on the, put him on the SUV. Um, he gets behind it, just no lights, no sirens, nothing like that. Um, now we're stopped. Now we're thinking outside the scope. We're stopped next to a Sam's Club, a Costco, yeah. an In N Out. You know. Yeah, your background is not clean. Horrible background. We do not want to get in a gunfight here. Yep. Um, so we take him out of the area going north, and Andy turns on his lights. Now he's got his siren on. Did his behavior, the SUV, did the driving patterns change at all when the black and white pulled up behind uh, him? To no, no. They. Uh, once the unit was behind him, green light, they start going, and hmm. he goes to take. We just took him out of that yeah. uh, shopping center. Um, goes to stop him up there, and now their driving pattern changed because they're not stopping. Yeah. Um, this is where we you just touched on it. We're not talking to each other. Um, Andy is putting out, and I've since heard the recording. Andy is putting out. All right, you know, his failure to yield, and he, yep. now he starts putting out to his Redlands guys. Hey, they're passing stuff around. They're putting vests on inside. Oh fuck! Is he dropping back at this point? He's he's still behind him. How you know, far? At a distance, I I don't know. Maybe eight car lengths back. Oof. I'm in the back of the pack now because I've brought, yeah. I've brought the guy to the party. Right, it's a dangerous spot. Two people in the vehicle. You can get zipped the fuck up to yeah. the rear. Oh, absolutely. Window. And it, and it almost happened. And Andy's putting out over his Redlands channel. You know, they're acting furtively. They're passing stuff around. Hey, it looks like they're putting vests on inside. Um, so now I'm like. I already know they're they're not stopping. So for yeah. me in my San Bernardino world, we're talking to each other. I know they're not stopping, and I'm so I'm grabbing my vest. I'm putting my. Yep. Um, I remember I was reaching for my helmet. I had it sitting below, um, and somehow maybe in a quick turn or something, it had rolled off, and I couldn't get it. <laughs> 
And as I'm reaching for my vest, dude, I heard pop. I'm like, oh, it's on now. And I remember thinking, I go, oh, shit, here we go. And so they make a, an eastbound turn into kind of an industrial area that mm -hmm. has some houses around it. Two lane road on each side with the suicide lane down the middle. Um, so you got my whole team. I'm at the back of my team, which is roughly what, eight, nine guys. We're all UC cars. And you have a, a sheriff's department unit that is joined in and a Redlands PD unit. Yep. Uh, two Redlands PD units actually, because he had a second body that was calling calling the pursuit. As soon as it, as soon as I heard that pop, I'm like, all right. So according to him, first shot, back window shatters, and they start dumping rounds at us out the back. Fuck. Then they just stopped, dude. Just went, er, stopped in the middle of the street. Actually in the number two lane, so up against the curb. Yeah. Now there's houses around them. But we've got a long stretch of road going to the east, long stretch of road going to the west. I remember I see my guys stopping, and I could hear the first couple rounds start going off. And I remember seeing, I don't know why I looked through, but I saw a sheriff's deputy unit that was in front of all my guys, in front of the Redlands unit. So bad guy car, yep. sheriff's car, all of us behind. I, From what I understand, he was trying to grab his rifle, yep. and he's trying to work the radio, and everybody stopped. And he went, oh, shit. And so now he's stuck yep. in the middle. This is where my, you know, maybe making that, that call, and like you said, you're just focused in on it. Um, not thinking about anything else, reverted back to Marine Corps training. Just basic infantry. Yeah. The However long we get it, infantry training. Um, I went, use your battle, somewhere in my mind, use your battle space. Yeah. F get a better shooting angle, is what I remember thinking. So. And I, are they going hot out of the SUV at this point? Oh, yeah, yeah. Both of them or just the one in the back? She's blowing rounds out the back towards us. And as I stop, so I'm kind of on the north side of the street. All my guys are moving from north to south. Um, so I'm in the westbound lanes. Um, as I grab my rifle and come up, I see him, he's out of the car and now he's shooting at my guys and are I'll they returning fire? Yet? Oh yeah. yeah. People okay. are starting to return fire. But as it that long to look down, he was not there. Grab my rifle. Oh shit. He's out shooting. I just dropped my rifle on my, my dash yep. and I put two rounds through the, through windshield. the windshield. Yeah. yeah. Just as quick as I could. And I know there's the. Don't shoot through the windshield theories, but sometimes you have to shoot through the windshield. It was it just it messes with ballistics a little bit. Yeah, and I saw him, I saw him flinch. Yeah, when I pulled those rounds off, so I'm like, I know I probably hit him in yeah. somewhere torso. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I'm starting to come out of my car, he starts flanking that deputy. So now he's moving from south to north. The deputy's behind his his unit. Yeah, shooting at the shooting at him. Now she's transitioning her fire. So now they're starting to triangulate him. Oh, they're getting him in an L. Yeah. Yeah, which is, it's awesome to be in an L if you're a part of the L. L. Yeah. It's if not you're... awesome to be the L if you're in the middle of the L. Right. So he's taking rounds from her. She's shooting back at my guys. She's now throwing the passenger door open so she can shoot at him. Um, he's flanking him from the top. So he's moving from south to north. And I don't know. He never saw me. Um, yeah. Dude, I just went, fire team rush. I was yeah. like, I'm up they see, you know, what is it? I'm up there, he sees me, I'm down kind yeah. of thing. I just started running and I was probably about nine, about, a, I'd say 30, 40, maybe yards, 50 yep. yards. Yeah, it was, I think it was like 120 something. I don't remember. Um, but it's, I remember screaming at the deputy, stay down, I'm shooting past you. But there's so many freaking rounds going on. Oh, for off. sure. And you yeah. don't have your pro in. No, none. I got my little coil from my radio yeah. that I can hear, but that's, I don't even remember hearing anybody talking on that thing during this whole thing. There's probably going to be some audible exclusion going on yeah. with all that shit. And I just shot in my, inside my, my van yeah. <laughs> with no windows down. I'm sure the chocolate lab was like, God damn it, uh, yeah. man. And you know what? He had never been to the range before. There's no need. He's not a SWAT dog. <laughs> poor, poor Mac. Poor buddy. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, I, I remember screaming, just stay down. I'm shooting past you. And I just proned out in the street and just these little, little things I thought about was, I remember hearing, you need, and you know, you know what rounds sound like Snaps, snapping yeah. past you. Um, you know what incoming and outgoing fire sounds like. For sure. And I could hear that incoming fire. And I remember making myself as small as I possibly could. So I proned out. Um, and I'm just in the middle of the street. I have no cover. I have no concealment. I'm just waiting for this guy to come around the car and I'm going to dump him. Yeah. Um, I remember I, I put my magazine on the ground. Yeah. And I remember going, 
you've never shot like this. And I brought myself back <laughs> up onto my elbows. It's good that you recognize that. Yeah. It would have been fine, but. Yeah, it would have been fine, but yeah. it was just one of those things like, make yourself as small as you can. Yeah. And I mean, I, we weren't taught to put our mags on the ground in the Marine Corps, and I've never shot like that. So. Yeah. Anyway, I put the first volley into him, and he he stumbled. So he eventually did come around the car. Yeah. So he's so now he's on in my lanes now. So basically the westbound. And lanes. is he just dumping as he's coming around? Yeah. He's sh- yeah. He's shooting. He's coming yeah. around. He's shooting at the at the depth. He just does. He never looked down the road to see. He that probably had some tunnel vision yeah. going on too. Was and, he? Was he? professional in his movements did he have it shoulder no. do you think he was aiming or okay. i think he was aiming but he's a call of duty warrior okay which is i'm glad yeah i don't oh, want hell yes. yeah the trained individual that's hey, i'm curious and that's what i and i say this all the time i go if they knew what they were doing this would have been a lot different yeah um they were anyway yeah uh, he was he was i mean he was taking movements he was I, I don't know why he got out of the car. I don't know why he didn't use it for cover. I don't, you know what or I mean? Or just stopped it in general. It's interesting. Yeah, it just stopped. Like, we're going to make Custer's last stand here. Or I don't know what it was. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so he, as soon as I put those first rounds into him, I saw him stumble. I didn't even see him drop his rifle. I'm So I'm shooting iron sight, so I'm just concentrating on my front sight. Yep. Um, And then he fell down, and he rolled over, and I remember thinking, all right, he's, he's down. And this guy sits up like a freaking undertaker in WWF sits up and he pulls a freaking handgun and starts shooting at me and the deputy. But I think he had a limp wrist and yeah. it caused a stove pipe. Interesting. Um, so while he starts popping rounds at us, I'm, I start shooting him in the right side. And then I remember thinking, am I hit? I could see a vest. And I'm like, am I hitting him in body armor? Yes. Yeah. I thought that's I was when hitting. you take the inside of his face and put it on the yeah. outside of his face. Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 all I did was this transition down and yep. I started hitting him in the pelvis. pelvis. Yep. Yep. And his thighs. And I remember thinking, well, he's going to bleed out from there. Yeah. I don't know why. Never even dawned on me to pull up the front sight and try to get a head shot. You yeah. Because he was, he had fallen back. Yeah. That's why there was. It might not have presented itself. Yeah. Yet. It really didn't present itself. It was just, okay, well, I'm not going to shoot him in body armor. So just move down to an area where he's going to die quickly. Yeah. So I put the rest of the rounds in him and then he just stopped moving. Yeah. And then it was, now the gun battle's still going on over here because she's shooting at all my buddies and the deputy still. And I remember thinking, oh shit, get up and go. Like, I'm not going to sit here and just keep my gun on him. He's not moving anymore. I'm pretty sure he's taken 10 to 15 rounds. How many magazines did you have on you when you were moving around? Four. Okay. I always backtrack on this story a little bit. <laughs> backtrack on the story. And I will tell you why I always had a rifle past this point was the Chris Dorner thing. Do you remember that? Where that cop from LA? Not at all, no. Yeah, there was a cop from LA got fired and then he killed... Uh, some people ended up killing a couple cops. Didn't in the, he? They in he Empire. died in a house that burned. Yes. Okay. Not, I was on that. He was uh, Big Bear. Big Bear. Yeah, okay. Around yeah. Big Bear area. Um, right off the thirty-eight. I do remember that. We we were close to being some of the first guys there. Went during the shootout. I mean, he had lit up a, a fish and game unit, and he had already shot two sheriff's deputies up there. And we got there, and I remember thinking, none of us have rifles. I think one of us had a rifle. Um, I had a shotgun that I just loaded with slugs. Yeah. So, you know, just a quick little, I never went out without my rifle. Those, those moments leave a mark. Yes. On yeah. your memory. 100%. Yeah. So, but you have to live through them for that mark to yeah. uh, make a difference. Yeah. I know that guy was shooting a freaking <laughs> scoped silence 308 and here I am with a shotgun with slugs. Uh, so I never, never past that point did I ever go out without a rifle. Yeah. So yeah, uh, getting back to it, I had, I had four magazines. Okay, on me. good. Yeah, I kept them inside my vest. I think I had. Perfect. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> right. Because you threw your vest on. Yep. Yeah. So, the screwed up thing, and this would have come in handy, was I had initially had a magazine that I threw in the cargo pockets of my shorts on my left side. Um, I don't know where and when or why I did it, but I ended up stuffing it into a pouch or something mm-hmm. on my vest. So now, back to the gunfight. I'm running. And I'm shooting, and I'm yelling for the deputy to come back. I'm trying to get him to come back while I'm covering him. I'm just dumping covering fire down yeah. in the car just to keep that person's head down. Didn't know it was a chick. Yeah. Um, Shouldn't matter I anyway. just know that they're shooting at me. Yeah. Um, Doesn't matter if exactly. it's a man or a woman. So I'm trying to get to uh, a corner by a house uh, on the street because I remember thinking, all right, there's some raised earth above the curb that I can at least take a little bit of cover yeah. behind and still have a shooting lane. Um, so I'm running, yelling to the deputy to come, and I'm shooting – and then just felt it right in my thigh. Just felt like somebody hit me with a baseball bat. Left uh, leg? Left leg, right where that magazine was. 
I wish I would have kept that damn magazine there because it would. I don't know what it would have done. But it would have gone through it, and you. It, it. Yeah. I mean, you still would have been damaged. I slowed, slowed it down, maybe. I don't know. How high up on your leg? Uh, just mid leg, right? Mid leg, right here. I got shot about eight inches above that. So it was closer to your hip. Closer to my hip. I would not have been able to put a tourniquet on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's probably one I of the worst places. I understand the yeah. feeling of having your leg swept out from underneath you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then you know the, oh, shit, my femoral feeling. That's uh, before I, I hit the ground, the thought went through my head, I have about five minutes left on earth. That's what I thought. I thought I was going to bleed out. I thought I got two to three minutes left. Yep. I, I, Did it make your entire leg numb, like that uh, funny bone sensation? <sighs> kind of, yeah. As soon as it hit... My, so I mine did that, and it, that's why I thought I was fucked, because I assumed that that was what it would feel like when the, the bones just shattered. Shattered, yeah. Which, of course, would detonate veins, arteries, all exactly. that stuff, and I was going to bleed out into my pelvic girdle or leg space yeah. and be done. That's the same thought. Yep. That's the same thought I had. I remember trying to take, as soon as it hit me, right foot, left foot, and then it was just nothing there, and I just fell over. Yep. I kind of pulled myself behind that area that I was aiming for initially. I remember just looking up at this is microseconds, you know. I remember looking up at the sky, looking at the clouds, and going, "You fuck, you got shot." And I remember thinking something stupid. I remember, I can't believe you got shot. You're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, your enemy has a boat too. <laughs> yeah. Did you I, have a tourniquet on you? I did have a tourniquet. Good. Yeah, I kept one in my I kept one in my uh, vest. Um, did you put it on yourself? No, I did not because at this point I remember uh, you still got gunshots going off yeah. behind me. But Rule I'm one. Not, Win the gunfight. Exactly. Actually, rule one is don't get into a gunfight. Rule two yeah, is win, win the that gunfight. gunfight. Get <laughs> off that exit. Win that gunfight. Right. Yep. So, I and this is why I didn't put a tourniquet on. Is I, I pulled my shorts up and I and I looked and I remember going, "Fuck!" I could see a hole. Yeah. But then I remember looking at it again, going, "Well, it's not firing blood out like yep. it's a femoral hit." And I could see it starting to bleed, but I'm like, "Yeah, okay, well, it's not femoral." And Did I, it uh, pass through? Stopped right at my femur. Okay. I mean, that close to my femur. So that was the running joke is I've always said I can't find pants that fit right because I have big Hawaiian thighs and the big Hawaiian thighs Saved stopped the life. bullet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it, it uh, I remember it was just self-care, really. I mean, yeah. doing that real quick, um, looking, okay, it's not femoral, but then I remember thinking, your leg's broken. That's that's what I was thinking at yeah. that point. Um, so I remember thinking, well, if you got two to three minutes or you're bleeding internally, you know, don't uh, don't go out on your back. So yeah. I remember I, I kind of pulled myself back out in the street and I started screaming at the deputy, "Come back!" And I'm started shooting. And I, once again, I'm shooting past you. Yep. Um, somebody comes up. He was a, he was a deputy for another county. Uh, comes running up, and I don't know where he came from, but he goes. He's like tourniquet, tourniquet. You need a tourniquet. And I remember going, "No." I said, "Pressure dress it as tight as you can." So he pulls out a pressure dressing. I'm laying on my side. He's got my leg yeah. up and he's pressure dressing it while I'm dumping down covering fire for him. I like this story. Yeah. So, <laughs> gosh, I can't believe it happened. Uh, so he's, he pressure dresses it. And I remember I, this is the first time I went dry on the mag. Yep. And I remember telling him I'm dry, shoot. And I don't know if it was his gunshot, but I heard pop. And I was best magazine change I think I've ever done in my life. Awesome. It just went in like butter and it was a slap and the bolt was forward again and I was already back on. Hell yeah. It was quick. And I just remember thinking, that was the best magazine change you've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing this for a while, but that was the best one. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and at this point, I see a, a sheriff's department police car start cruising up. And I see my buddy, who I worked with at San Bernardino PD, who now worked for Redlands, he's screaming at me, get in the car, get in the car. So now they've moved it up for yeah to, as an officer rescue for me. And where is the woman at this point? She says it's still in the back seat. Oh, no shit. Yeah. So it's kind of sporadic. She would pop up and fire. Yeah. But she essentially had an entire firing line just every time she popped up. Yeah. I mean, this car was Swiss cheese at the end of this Oh, I'm sure. Fight. I was amazed yeah. she was still alive at that yeah, point. Yeah. She had some metal in front of her. I don't know. You yeah. Know, something was deflecting enough where she wasn't taking direct hits, unlike her husband. Um, but yeah, so they did an officer rescue. And I remember thinking at some point after I got shot, I'm like, get up, get in the fight. Don't let them see you hurt. Because I know that people operate out of emotion sometimes. Yeah. When you see an officer go down, you know, you're going to put yourself at risk. And we're thinking, okay, it's, it's not that bad. Get back and, and get into it. Um, but they, these dudes are badass. They came in. They rolled through, used the car as rolling cover. Uh, my buddy and I, who worked for Redlands, uh, end up kind of getting a little – he's trying to put me in the car, and I'm going, I'm good. And he shoves me in the back seat, and then I got back out. Yeah. And I'm like, let's go get the, the uh, deputy. A couple San Bernardino SWAT guys showed up. We start moving forward and uh, essentially got up to the deputy and we laid down covering fire for him to run back to us. Yeah. He got behind the unit and we just kind of rolled back and uh, 
that was it. Yeah, that was. There was no more gunfire. She wasn't shooting anymore. She, ex- I'm assuming she expired in the vehicle. Oh yeah, I think she had half her head left at some point. It's good. It's yeah. unfortunate that it was yeah. half left. Yeah, too bad. Yeah, um, I would have liked to hear that it was all gone. I know. I think. <laughs> I, I, I assume somebody might have hit her with a slug. Or, you yeah. Know, it was. It was. You Pretty know, gnarly. She, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean that that car was shot to shit. Um, so how many officers were injured? Uh, me. Really. This is yeah. That's the stupid part of stupid luck, right? Something's How many watching. rounds do you think were fired by between the pair of them in just that they, portion? Because obviously two, there was the uh, during the during the actual officer involved shooting. Yeah, they fired between eighty and ninety rounds, I think, at us. It's a lot. Yeah, um, and then there were twenty three, I think, shooters. A lot of people showed up during the gunfight and got some. Yeah, nobody was running away. Everybody was running into gunfire. Yep. Um, I mean. For an average person to hear what sounds like a freaking Mogadishu going on on their street, they're going to go hide. These guys are freaking sprinting through rows of cars to get there. Um, but no civilians hit by any of the rounds? No. That is Dude, I have insane. no idea. Insane. This, as so as the gunfight stopped, and I'm somebody had driven my van up, so now I'm worried about Mac. Yeah. Because I'm like, who used my car for cover? Mac's in there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And this is where, you know. My bad, Mac. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I look in there and I'm looking at the third row and I'm like, Mac. And his eyes were like saucers. Oh, you and think? he's just sitting there like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, are you hurt? Are you hurt? There was a bullet in my windshield yeah. that it hit. And I'm like, he's, I'm like, God, please don't be hurt. You know, that, that would crush me. And then he just like snapped out of it. And he's just like, oh, hey, what's up, dad? <laughs> I'm like, you asshole. <laughs> so, so I grab, you know, I grab my cell phone and, and I shut the door. Um, and I remember grabbing somebody and saying, Hey, my dog's in here. Don't forget him. Please yeah. don't forget my dog. Um, cause I, you know, now it's time to go to the hospital. Yeah. Um, and, uh, SUV came, they threw me in the SUV, but now we're, you know, and I talk about this at conferences and stuff. Um, now there's nowhere to get out. Um, we can't drive past the two dead guys cause there's bombs in the car essentially. Uh, we can't get out this way because there's a hundred plus police cars all over the street. Mm-hmm. And it took a little bit to get to through that out. mess. Yeah. Um, but once we got out of it, I remember seeing this line of ambulances and fire trucks coming. And the guy driving cut him off. He goes, I got the down officer here. Um, and they were great. And they freaking, we got out and they started working on me automatically. They threw me in. And I didn't want to get my rifle up. Yeah. You know? Smart and call. They, they keep saying, it, just pass it off. It's going to. And so I waited for somebody that I knew. And, Gave it to them. Yeah. Man. I'm like, hey, it's still hot. You know? Yeah. <laughs> There's one in the chamber. Um, but at that point, I had, when I was in the SUV trying to get out, I had called my wife and I said, um, this is a screwed up thing about the scanners and the, and the apps and things like that. She and my family were all listening to this. And really? They, and they hear, there's an officer down. And then they hear my name. Now, and the other tie to it. <sighs> that's my, not the type of notification you want. Yeah. So they're freaking out. But on top of that, my brother works for Colton PD, where my dad had just retired from, my younger brother. He's on the receiving end where all of our fire was going. So he's down at the other end of the street, basically blocking traffic and yeah. hiding behind to make sure. Um, so now there's two of us there. So family doesn't know if it was me or if it was him that got hurt. Yeah. So, you know. Just I, to add more uncertainty yeah. to that emotional situation. Right? So I called I called her and said, uh, she's like, are you all right? And I said, I got shot. And she goes, where are you going? And I said, well, Melinda, Bye. She was on it, man. She, you know, at the very beginning of that, she was going to, at the day, she was going to Cal State San Bernardino, which is the college up there. Mm-hmm. And as soon as it had happened and we got into the city, I called her and I said, go home now. I said, leave your class, get up and go home. I go, we don't know where they're at. And you guys are a huge soft target. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking there. I was like, they're going to go secondary this thing. Um, wow. Yeah. What so a the, crazy day, man. Yeah. So, did you spend any time in the hospital? Or did they release yeah, you? I was there for I don't know a day and a half or so. Yeah, I uh, they took great care of me, and it was it was kind of a shit show trying to get into the ER because there's about ten thousand news cameras there. Yeah. Oh, they're under a bomb threat warning. Uh, How long did mess. it take to unwind all that stuff to clear the vehicle to get the bomb all? They were assuming obviously that it was going to be. They were going to have explosives. Um, I don't think they found the they found the trigger, but they didn't find any more explosives. They found like two thousand rounds of AR. Really? Yeah, um, extra mags, um, ammo cans. I mean, they had they had a shit ton of ammo. They just didn't have a lot of magazines. Um, I think it took three ish days for that 
two to three days. Wow. Yeah. So the good thing is that Matt got out of the van. Somebody took him to the station. He yep. got to hang out in the kennel. So I was I'm like, whatever, my van could sit there for as long as it wants. I'm not going anywhere. In the days afterwards, or as the investigate, I'm assuming that they obviously, well, I remember seeing it on the news. They started talking yeah. to the neighbors and all that stuff. How long had they been planning that? Were they able to, able to determine like yeah. what breadth so, and depth of planning went into they that? They had gone back and, because the FBI essentially came in and took over the- It was an act of domestic terrorism. It was, temer- it was terrorism. They, yeah. they deemed it to be terrorist act. Uh, they took over the actual IRC um, where they actually went in, left the bomb, and okay, killed gotcha, everybody. Gotcha. Uh, like the sheriff's department took over the sh- uh, the shooting scene where we got in the gunfight. So I mean, it was like multiple different places. Now they got to go to their house, and they found I don't know a bunch of pipe bombs in the garage. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, so from what we learned, it sounded like where he got the weapons was an old neighbor, and he had started pushing this kid to convert. And they were actually planning an attack in Riverside at the community college several years before that. But some FBI did a big takedown and wiped out some terrorist cell that was operating in Southern California. Really? And they went, oh, shit, backtrack on that. So they pulled off of that. Yeah, back into the hidey hole for a bit. Exactly. So, and then, and it just, you know, talking to some of the victims um, who we all kind of became friends with after this, they had said, we started noticing him kind of changing. His beard started getting longer, started, stopped in the middle of the day, started praying. Um, essentially, his wife was saying, don't participate in any non-Muslim holiday celebrations. So he started becoming a lot more strict. Yeah. And that time period, they don't know where, you know, that trigger went off and what this, when they decided to do it. They had a little kid, you know. They That's had an infant. right. Yeah. They did. Where Didn't they take the infant somewhere, too? Uh, that kid was at home with the grandma, I think, or the aunt, or somebody that was still in that, that apartment where we initially started out and found them. Yeah. Um, there was units that were able to get there quick enough to see them packing up and trying to leave, and they got snatched snatched up, and I think a black van came and took huh. them somewhere. I don't know. Interesting. But, yeah, so they had, a, they had a bunch of crap in their in their house. but um, So, yeah, that kid, the kid that uh, bought him all the, the rifles and, and all that stuff, he had him buy that the rifles that they used because he didn't want to draw any sort of suspicion because yeah. he has, you know, a Muslim name. So it what took a, it a took a, shit show. Yeah. And just after that, dude, the, as far as like the, uh, you know, getting better in physical therapy and all that stuff. And then, you know, so starts kind of setting in for a lot of guys. Uh, the, the mental aspect of it started hitting a lot of, especially the guys that went in, saw that carnage. Yeah. You know. I, uh, I can only imagine. Yeah. I don't have the words to describe, but I'm yeah. certain that it How looked like. How do you like. prepare for something? I mean, you can do fake you training, don't. but yeah, um, there's no emotion in it. But if you know, real, yeah. Um, Did the it, department take actions to try to help those guys? I'm sure they had assets, yeah, and resources you know, available. We to them. went. So when you get in a shooting, you got to go talk to the the um, psychologist before yeah. you can even go home, and then before you go back to duty. Um, they had some. They tried. They did some like big group therapy things and i'm like nobody's gonna open up here and i'm hoping that guys would have gone and and this is where it started kind of hitting on me and i'm like what where why am i feeling like this what the hell is going on what were you noticing in yourself i was becoming a lot more short i probably started drinking more than i you know did to go to sleep Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and it's not like i was blackout drunk it's like fine i just need to go need to not have that dream dreams like this it was i don't know what it was man it got to a point where I'm like, I gotta go. I gotta go do something about this. Yeah. Um, and this is where you know, present day, um, I am a big advocate for guys going to the counseling team, going and getting help, and like, hey, look, you can still carry a gun and go yeah. through counseling. You're fine. They're not gonna snatch your gun and your livelihood away from you. I am trending towards the belief that it should be mandatory. I think so too. The only reason I think that is that that wouldn't work is that some people because it is mandatory would participate less like as a person you know what i mean they'd be like they're not going to give in they're not going to give yeah. up. they're not going to lean in or they'll be resi- all, yeah. yeah they'll be resistant to it but the mental health mental hygiene aspect of what uh, officers and i again get this from only talking with them but just getting a snapshot of what they are encountering often there's no yeah there's no downside and they no should downside. and they should Fine. expect that that the stuff that you guys see it should bother you well, if I it mean, doesn't bother you you might be a little ted bundy exactly and then 
you get a situation like you get in Minneapolis. You got all this shit that stacks up on you for X number of years. You never go, you know, pull that rug up and clean it out. Think about it. You, you go 25, 30 years in a career and you never go to the counseling. You, you're, what kind of retirement are you going to have? You're just going to unpack that when you're done? Yeah. You know? What, well, the life expectancy for retired officers isn't great. My dad just died last year, 54. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. What did he sucked. die of? He had a blood clot that turned into a stroke. And it sucked, dude. I've heard that heart disease gets a lot of yeah. officers. And I don't, I, mean, I could be completely wrong, but I've heard that. It, there is a shorter life expectancy, just like their military and cops. Yeah. We got a freaking 50% what, divorce rate, you know? How was your experience when you went to go seek help? What was your department? Did they get you in front of somebody or linked up with somebody I, pretty they rapidly? Nobody, nobody knew that I was going to do this on my own. Oh, okay. I mean, so you it's, still, it it's still taboo. I'm not gonna lie. People look at it and they can give you the oh maybe he's being a pussy or uh, oh if the department knows they're gonna they're gonna bench me and not let me work or something like that. So I went on my own. And yeah. I ended up going through uh, EMDR therapy. Okay. Put the little sensors in your hands. I've heard really good things about that. Yeah. And she kept asking me to pinpoint, you know, what was bothering me about that. And I'm like, look, dude, I have no problem killing these people. They need to die. I have no problem with what happened here. Yeah. I go. It was that damn call that I made. That's where really, it was. yeah. It How just, were you able to work your way through that or to find closure on that? I don't know. She just kept going. Okay, what'd you get from that? And another ten to fifteen seconds thinking about. Okay, what'd you get from that? What'd you get from that? What'd you get from that? Um, I just had to. I just guess I had to really go through step by step and find the thing that was. Because to be honest, every time I drove past that on the freeway, that on ramp, I would immediately go at, think, start thinking about. It's a trigger. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, even the stupid clouds. I, when the clouds looked the same way, when I was laying on my back shot, I remember I'd look at them and like, oh, man, my head just went there. Why? Yeah. So just going through that kind of sad. And I wasn't feeling any, you know, it, I'm not going to go out and start blowing people away. I'm not going to yeah. start hitting my wife. I'm not, you know, it was just, I'm tired of feeling like this. Yeah. And I think it was just, to be honest, 10 years of being a, a cop in a, in a pretty violent city. And then that was just the a straw. A very violent event. Yeah. That was just the straw that kind of broke it. And- you know, I'm glad I went, I'm, and I'm like I said, I'm a very big proponent pushing guys to go do it now. Yeah, I think it, you should. Is it changing? Is the taboo portion of that? I can see eroding? it. That, so, after the shooting the next year, I lateraled to Redlands next door. Okay. So I'm a Redlands Redlands officer now. Why'd you make that choice? <sighs> Financially, the city was bankrupt. Still, they're having problems. Um, and then just after all this shit, I was like, I need to slow down. Yeah. You know, move over to a city where there's less violent crime and people like the cops there. And to be honest, a lot of my friends had lateraled over there and they were said nothing but good things. And I was like, now's my time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I lateraled over there. But how long were you off after the injury? Till you were- I came back about three months. I was back working full time. Okay. So I worked my ass off in physical therapy, man. That sounds was, like it. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I'm like, fuck these guys. They're not keeping me down. Yeah. You know? Did yeah, they end up uh, doing surgery surgery to remove the no, uh, round? No, still in there. Yeah, yeah. so is mine. Yeah, they said it's a risk reward thing, and they'll cutting it up and getting it out is going to cause me more damage or then something. Leaving it in, yeah. Yeah, and you know, obviously, we still feel it from time to time, and yeah. things hurt from time to time, but something we can't get through. Yeah. You know? How was it getting back on the streets after that three months? It wasn't too bad because I went back to narcotics, so okay. it's not like I was having a patrol and daily interaction with with a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I did notice that, you know, serving search warrants after that, I was like, I was always the first, trying to be the first one through the door once we hit it. I, and I don't know why. I don't know why. And I've heard this from other guys, like, eh, why put yourself in more danger? I, I don't know. There was just something there. I was like, okay, you gotta be the first, one, gotta be the first one through the door. I don't know. That was a weird part. But, um. Did you ever ask the therapist about it? No, because I didn't think about it until you just brought it up. Hmm. But yeah, I'm a huge advocate of talk. I talk to a guy every Thursday. Yeah. In the morning, and it's good. It, it helps my day for sure on that day. Well, I mean, sometimes actually, you know, sometimes those days are actually harder because of the shit you have to yeah, talk you about sit and there work and you're, your you're way kinda, through. You're kind of emotionally spent, especially when you first start. Yeah. You're spent, and you're like, okay, I'm just going to shut myself in for a day. Or especially if you have to work your way through a specific issue yeah. or topic, and yeah, it's I you mean, know working it's through that be stuff, emotional. I, again, I'm an advocate for seeking out that help, but I hope people realize that the seeking out the help is the easy part. 
Yeah. The difficult stuff it's comes when you start it. talking and yeah, oh, working sure. your way through working it. Working on it. That's where it gets hard. Yeah. And it, it was a lot of work. I think I did that EMDR therapy for three to four months. Yeah. You know? And then it, it got to the point where I was going every week. And then by the end of it, I just told her, I go, I don't know what to talk to you about today. Yeah. You that's know? good, though. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and it's there. It's there for all cops, especially in my county. We yeah. Have a, we have what's called the counseling team. And you can go there anytime. No questions asked for anything. Yeah, that's awesome. And another thing, I wish uh, I wish I had gone earlier, and I almost wish that I had gone even when shit wasn't bugging me. Do you think like when, a checkup? Yeah. Do you think when you were in the teams though that you would have gone? I know we all we all get wiser the further on we go, and we realize this now. But would I was that have ever crossed your mind? Um, I was forced to go when I got shot. Yeah, I wasn't against going when I did go. Uh, I had a very good conversation with the guy. I think we talked for, I don't know, thirty minutes, an hour, something like that. Um, man, I think I would have gone, but probably not been vocal about it. Do you think if you had guys that were senior to you and said, "Hey, you should probably go do this," I did it. You probably would have gone. Yes, and that's what and I'm I trying, think that would have helped. And that's what I'm trying to instill now is, saying, yep. "Hey, look, I went through a freaking pretty bad gunfight, and I'm not afraid to say." You, Let's go get. Let's go talk to somebody. Oh, and here's the thing too: it shouldn't require a gunfight to yeah. go for people to realize that it's okay because that's an extremely violent event. Yeah. And I think, I think the stats, the, the, the stats, statistics. <laughs> good God, are that it's less than ten percent of officers use their firearm in, oh, in the line of duty. That. I think it's less than five. I didn't want to go yeah. too low, but it's it's a really low percentage. But again. The number of times that you touch hands on somebody, the number of times that oh, you it's walk, almost, day, it's daily. And yeah. think about what that does to your endocrine system too. Like you pull a car over for you again. It's you know if you're not complacent and you're coming in at a ten and you're going to back yeah. yourself off, you're still peaks and valleys, peaks yeah. and valleys. And you're constantly like that. So yeah, what it does it do to, to your body? Yeah, it doesn't need to be a gunfight. You could. Yeah. It's like fuck, man. You're putting mileage on the car. Yeah. Take it in to get the oil checked. Exactly. A good analogy. That's, uh, that's you have to. You Oil have to. check is a negative connotation. No, 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 no. Take it in yeah. to take it in for it. the silver bullet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell the doctor you want an oil check. Exactly. It might get a little kinky and weird. Maybe Unless you're into that, in which I have no judgment, but I don't want to hear. Punch about it. your bore for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Horrible, horrible things in the military. I had a. Uh, let's see. Last Monday, Jason and Jessica Silver were on. I and, listened to that, and Jason, you know, was great about talking. Mm -hmm. to, I didn't know the advance, not advances, the strides that the community has taken towards removing a stigma or making it anything but taboo. And right. like I told him, I'd love to see. You know, you go to the gun range all the time. Yeah. Once a month, go like just go do a checkup. It actually, in the times that I have sat down and talked with somebody. More often than not, I will go in and I think I have something that I want to talk about because it's bothering me. Mm -hmm. But I will find that oftentimes it's not the thing that I thought was bothering me that is There's bothering me. something else if there. If that makes yep. sense. Uh, absolutely. That's like the expression of it. I'm yep. fucking pissed about this, but I'll leave with a better, at least a better understanding of what maybe is driving that emotional response to that. Right. And if you can get to the root of that, from my old job, and Jason and I, I think we both agreed on this, is that it would make you better at the job. You'd be more lethal. Oh, and in sure. your in your world where I want you guys to be lethal but never have to use it, right. it except for those you know, fuck sticks in the car, obviously, but it would make you better at the interactions with yeah. people and walking up and being able to recognize that. Because another thing that I have found in talking to people are coping strategies. Yeah. You know, I, I talk all the time about keeping your world small and- well, What do we do in- this, that, and the other. And, and I got that. It was passed down to me through people that I used to work with. But mm -hmm. recognizing emotions and their impact and recognizing, like for me, I, dude, when I get pissed, I feel, I'm like, my, I'm in fuego. Like I feel like yeah. my body is hot. And as soon as I recognize that, I try to stop making any and all decisions that have any type of gravity or importance. It's just going to be, it's not a Ooh, rational the, thought. The emails that I can send in those moments, <laughs> listen here, motherfucker. And it's just like, ah, okay. That's why I don't have social media. Hey, sometimes I'll type it out. <laughs> But I don't send it. Yeah. You know, in my younger days, I would type and send. Now I'm like, hmm, no send, yeah. but I'll type and I'll get it out. And it's out and I'm good now. But it starts with recognizing those emotions and it really has helped me sitting down and talking with somebody who's objective. Yeah. And it's uncanny how many times I thought I was pissed about something, but the reason I was pissed was something that I wasn't paying attention to yeah. and I needed to work on that shit. And I did. And 
I, that's what I'm saying. I would go in times where you're not, you don't feel under the weight of it. Go when you feel light, not when you feel heavy. Right. I think the other stigma to it, especially in law enforcement, is guys go, well, they don't know. They're not cops. They never, they never did that or, or military. You get that they in the teams, get, too. Yeah. You get that in the teams, too. And you know what that is? That's a fucking excuse. It's just an excuse, and you have a stupid ego that needs to be checked. Just go. They're yeah. there for a reason. Yeah, they. you know why? Because while you were doing your cop thing or your SEAL thing, they were in school. Yeah. And they were learning about exactly. the shit in between your yeah. ears. And, yeah, if you, you know. We're just dragging knuckles while they're getting smarter. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't uh, do the maintenance on my truck. I take it to professional. Right. Right? And the guy doing the maintenance on the truck. He might not even have the truck that I have. Yeah. What am I going to say? Oh, you don't have an F-150? Fuck you. Yeah. I'm not going to let you service exactly. my car. Right. No, it's like, come on, man. Yeah. Let's put this back but in like the you said, it's, just, it's an excuse. And a lot of yeah. guys use that excuse. And I go, it, just stop. Just, you know, I was trying to push policy through because there's, there's some agencies that require you to get your eval each year. You got to go to the counseling yep. team. I would love to see that implemented in my, my department. I think you'd originally or initially get pushback and then it would be wildly accepted. Yeah. If you want to sit there for 60 minutes with your arms yeah. crossed and stare at him and not say anything, then that's on you. Good luck in your marriage. You know? But, you know, that's another one. And uh, Jason was talking about that with Jessica, the ability to bring the spouse in. I think yeah. that was a huge one that the command on the East Coast uh, spent a very short amount of time there. He spent a long time there. But allowing and having those resources where you can have somebody sit in between because your wife doesn't have the same experience as yeah. you do. But to have another tool that sits in between you guys to help connect that triangle, I think is huge. Yeah. Because the you know the divorce rate in the SEAL teams is high. Yep, um, it's got to be the same in law or maybe higher than law enforcement. I, I'd say it's in the seventieth percentile. Oh yeah, three quarters. Are, I think it's like fifty percent. And um, you know my own, my own marriage that failed. Um, there were issues of, of, of me not working through and dealing with stuff, but yep. also there are some things that I have lived through that I cannot talk about with my ex-wife, yeah. that she will not understand. She's not going to understand it. She probably doesn't want to hear some of it. And I don't want her to hear it yeah. because I actually don't want anybody to have a tainted, I guess it would be opinion of who I am mm -hmm. based on the things that I have done. Yeah. And having somebody who could connect those dots, I think would have helped. And we did yeah. pursue... Uh, we went to counseling. I am, have no doubt she would say we did either did not go enough or we didn't take it seriously. That is no longer germane because the relationship has come to an end. But also, maybe you need to see more therapists or find the right therapist or find yeah. the right mechanism. It would yeah. have. We pursued it, but you know, but not enough. But I think having that person that can help you take on the information and be the bridge gap and hopefully present it in a way where they can at least understand what's yeah. happening to you or where you are coming from, I think that would be huge. Yeah. And you know what, bring, you bringing that up, it, I totally passed it over. Um, one of the reasons I went to counseling is we got divorced Yeah. after after that. And I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. But it shit happens. Yeah. You know? But yeah, that's, it's just one of those things that I, I'm, I'm an advocate for because I know I can look back at myself when I was, you know, a brand new cop or, you know, now I'm like, settle down. Yeah. You know? A lot of that comes with, you know, the wisdom that comes with age. Yeah. As men, of course, we have no wisdom because we're yeah. essentially 14 years old on the inside. There you go. I look at it like my, as the calendar years flip by, I'm like, ha, <laughs> I'm fooling people again. Exactly. They think I'm older and wiser. <laughs> but instead, thankfully, there's not a recording device that transmits my thoughts they'd because they'd be like, you be are a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, if people listen to it and they're, you know, listen to this and they're starting to have those thoughts or they're starting to. Yeah, kind of have those turns in the marriage where it's going so good. Just, just, just go, just go. And well, here's like the you thing. said, if, if it, and if the marriage ends, and you did go to counseling, at least you can say you put the time and energy mm -hmm. in, and you tried. And if it helps and your marriage continues, awesome. Yeah. That's great. You have nothing to lose by trying. Right. So yeah, you still take. Uh, you still passionate about the job? You still get a lot of uh, fulfillment, or did you ever get? Was the job what you thought it would be of being a police officer? Yes and no. I didn't think people would hate you. I came up obviously. Look, I came up and and my grandfather was a cop and my yeah. dad and uncles are cops. Yeah. I mean, you had a family legacy that I you were, am looking yeah. at it like you're freaking superheroes. I remember thinking that of all my dad's partners back, you know, back in the day. Um, I didn't think that people would get 
the way that they are now towards cops because I always looked at them like cops can't do any wrong you know and then I become yep. a cop and you become older and you're like well there's some shit bags yep. um, do I get fulfillment from it I do I, I still like helping people you know the job I do now I'm still in narcotics yeah um, but I feel like that has got to be like running uphill against a soft sand burn yeah, that is constantly having more sand dumped on top yeah. of it and, and it is and anything that we hit is a drop in the bucket you know so you, I don't get those daily interactions like you yeah. get on patrol where you're like okay I actually did help somebody out on this do you think there's a if you could get into a place where you could change policy or put in new policy what would you change about how drug use or the criminality of drugs how would you address it in the country because Dude, i don't that's a socioeconomic problem i don't think anybody can land on i don't think you just give up and and uh and legalize make it everything legalized. yeah May, wave your magic wand and it's all legal i don't think yeah. that helps i mean that's what uh, i remember saying years ago in california i go when and i don't care if people smoke marijuana but yeah i'm like when marijuana falls others gonna fall and i remember getting passionate debates people go no that'll never happen look at now it's it's ticking that way with the rest of them heroin and cocaine and all that stuff are they talking about making heroin and cocaine legal it's like i mean you got that that libertarian argument that says just legalize a lot of this but i mean they've dropped it down from a felony to a misdemeanor and I yeah mean, and anyway uh shoot i don't know dude i really don't there's no there's you can't just legalize everything uh you got to spend a shit ton of money to try to get people in some programs and they have to be willing to do it yeah. one of the things that california did is they used to have a, a drug program and you had to go through this program and it's court ordered and if you popped on a piss test then you went and served your sentence interesting um, oh it was a way you could escape uh, jail time yeah it's gone now that, that went away with prop 47 so what do you what do you do uh i don't i don't Dude, know i don't have the answers i either. don't i have no idea you either go totally hard on it or you go totally soft i don't think there's living in this middle ground that there's Anything and with the, good that like, comes and from it. helping them manage the addiction and how deep the hooks of the stuff like meth and yeah, the heroin one, I, I you know I'll see some of the body cam footage of you. It gets a little methy up here, out in from them, time to time, out in them there hills. Yeah, and uh, I don't. I mean, fuck. I guess I either don't pay attention, but I just don't have a lot of experience with people on hard drugs. Yeah, to me, I would be like, oh, the man sleeping. I actually, well, you know. <laughs> We were in L.A. and I watched a man using a, a, the curb as a, a pillow. So I assumed that he was on some type of oh, sure. He was taking an excellent. He was taking a he nice was living his best gutter life. nap. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. He was appeared to be having a great nap yeah. in the gutter with his head <laughs> on the uh, on the curb. And Welcome it was like, to it, it noon on a Thursday. I was like, fuck, live your life, buddy. Welcome to the hellscape of L.A. Yeah. But then, you know, watching some of the body cam footage of these people on meth, it's like how it, like at some point how do you help them i mean are they does there enough of you their can brain only, you can only, exist yeah, to be helped at that i point? don't think so i think that you know and you, you stack on some psych issues on top oh, of that for sure. and i'm telling you man i've we've fought with people that are on meth and and going through having a psychotic event they're just as strong as somebody on pcp and a lot of people don't realize that yeah the good thing is though and i was talking i had uh, greg anderson on the cop from seattle mm -hmm. yeah it was a good one he good. and you know he's a it was an MMA fighter. He stand up black belt in jujitsu. He's like, hey, they might have superhuman strength, but no pill or needle is going to give you superhuman skill. Right? You know? Yeah. And it, I've been doing jujitsu now for two years, and it's actually to your advantage sometimes when somebody comes oh, at you sure. hot and hard like that. And when they want to use their strength, they off balance themselves. You can sweep them or get on top yep. of them, and you got to ride the lightning for a little bit. But you got them. <laughs> well, you know, with the uh, with everything that's going on, they just took away our LVNR. We can't we can't LVNR. LVNR I'm assuming that is the restraining naked. Yeah, it's like a rear naked choke. What is it about in the case of an emergency, or is it now considered lethal force? Lethal force. Okay, so it's probably available to you, but it's considered the same as pulling. shooting somebody. Yes, that's idiotic. Absolutely, that is fucking idiotic. Thank if you. a practitioner who can, in the most it's not a passive restraint by any stretch of the, the imagination. The but most you could put somebody least to sleep. damage that you were going to cause another person by getting on getting on them, yes. taking their back, and they go out, handcuff, and we're done. This guy didn't get baton. He didn't get tased. You nothing. could literally be put out very gently, put to the ground, put on your side in a recovery position, put in handcuffs. This person's okay. Mm -hmm. The cop is okay. It's yeah. it's not. It it's one of the most gentle ways. That yeah. you could do that. And for them to remove that from you guys is problematic. It's making a job. Oh, New York is the same way. Yeah. They're talking about no pressure restraints at all. 
No. What is that? How do you even? I don't know. So you can't put somebody in a wrist lock or a control hold or. You um, know what I, I mean? think you can do that. I believe it was a um, uh, chest restraint. You cannot. Fuck. I don't want to speak out of school on this. Henry Gracie was losing his mind about this, and I'm so glad that he was because he trains cops all the time. It was you know a guard or a mount position. You yeah. cannot lay on top of somebody. How do you control somebody's body? I have no idea. You just so essentially what I I'm getting it, from, essentially yeah. what I'm getting from this is you want me to use overwhelming force but not use tools that are given to me. So if I can't lay on you and put you in handcuffs or I can't make you go to sleep for a couple seconds, now you're forcing me to use an impact weapon like yeah, a you're baton. forcing you to your Batman belt. Now I go to my belt. Yep. Now I'm going to a taser and oh you just fell and knocked out all your teeth cuz you just went face first into the curb or something. You know what I mean? It's, or as taser instances increase and those are now going to be the subject of social media that, are they going to take that from you and then you're going to be went, left with a baton and a gun that went when we first started or when they first started pushing tasers out to people yeah it went from lower than a it was like the equivalent of pepper spraying somebody and then they the courts determined that it was essentially like an intrusion to your body so it moved up interesting so now you're forcing me to go to impact weapons and, and tasers and things like that when i can go hands-on and have somebody in I yeah. feel people in your occupation need as many options as possible, yeah. not a limited set of options. You know, uh, a Phillips head screwdriver is great when you have a Phillips, Phillips head screw. There you go. It sucks when you have a nail. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I've hammered plenty of nails in with the back of a <laughs> screwdriver, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. It's I'd rather have somebody who can take open a, you know, zip, an open little briefcase. And these are the tools that I have yeah. available. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand the people who would... Um, take away those tools from you. I can understand how they would be viewed with fear only if you have no experience or exposure to them. Yeah. Can you kill somebody with a rear naked choke? Yes, you can. You can. But you could, like you said, it's, it's, it's the safest way to actually probably get a resisting, out of their mind drug. Because here's the thing, you can be on drugs all you want to. If you cut the blood supply off, on both sides of the neck. There's no more fight. <laughs> and you don't actually have to wrench on the neck. Um, there's a guy in town getting ready to do a seminar, Henry Akins, And he was actually working with me on my rear naked choke. I went to his house in Vegas and uh, we were training. And he's like, okay, put it on. And you know, uh, put it on and I was applying pressure. But not in the right direction and not in the right place. So mm -hmm. he moved my arm around a little bit. He's like, okay, relax. Just, you know, just connect to the neck and then pull up a little bit. And he tapped instantly. And then he did it to me the way I was doing it before and then the way that he showed me how to mm -hmm. do it. I'm not I'm not be like you're not contorting the neck. I'm not smashing teeth. It's just it's literally making the connection and holding pressure on two correct. spots of the yeah. Holding for a few seconds and nobody is getting shot, nobody's bleeding. Yeah. And I don't care what you're on. If yeah. I cut the blood supply off to your brain, you're gonna go down. Yeah. And I there's one of the guys I train with, he's one of the local sheriff deputies, and he's put a few guys to sleep. Yeah. And they deserved it. I'm and sure they woke uh, up in cuffs, and they were just like, "What happened, Thunderdome. Yeah, but nobody Nothing's, was injured. You can just stand there and watch them <laughs> thrash around because you're not going anywhere. And I tell you what, man, the actions that they were displaying before that—not the cops, but the the dude. Oh my God, he was. It, I'm pretty sure this was a meth one. He's like facing the wall, fucking kill me, kill. And I was like, oh shit. Yeah. Yeah, that brings up another good point. They're you know this the whole defund movement. They're pushing to have more social workers come out and deal with uh psychotic episodes or mental issues i'm all for it i'm for that as long as they can as actually as get can, there yeah. as long as there's not a two-hour wait while somebody you know what i mean yeah. and i again you call 911 i don't know the rules in this i'm not a dispatcher or have any time in the leo world but i would imagine sometimes you get a call and what you arrive to is not what the call came in for oh so absolutely. you're not going to know that yeah. it's a mental health crisis what i would like to see is maybe let's get some uh, training for officers. So they have a baseline level and then you can... We go through a lot of... It's called 5150 in California. We yeah. go through a lot of 5150 training. A lot. And, and Crisis good. response, uh, trying to trying to talk them down. De-escalation, like, yeah. yep. But guess what? When they see somebody standing there with a gun, sometimes all they want to do is fight. And yep. like I said, they could be just as strong as somebody on PCP. And I, it's yeah, like, not, hey, if you want to, if you guys want to go out there and you guys want to do it, go for it, man. It's going to cut calls for service down for a lot of departments if they start putting social workers in there. I can guarantee you that. It will until the situation turns violent and it terminates yep. in another 911 call. And yep. then you're going to have a social worker potentially physically involved, injured. And then you're, yep. then you're rolling ambulance, which probably, I think the fire trucks have to go with the ambulance, right? Something like that. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah. Have and you ever heard that firefighters are the true first responders? They are. They are America's heroes. Yeah. They call you guys the second responders. That's really weird, though. Yeah. We have to, you know, <laughs> we have to clear the scene for them. And so they come in. I remember what it is. Uh, I fucking secure. love the rivalry between cops and firefighters. I love fire. If yeah. I could go right now, I would go over. So... Yeah, let's go. I'll go be a firefighter for the rest of my career. And this is why I'm pushing my boys to be yeah. to be firefighters. I go, hey, why do you guys want to be firefighters? And I say, because you can uh, barbecue, play Xbox, and have Nerf gun wars. And on say, shift. On shift. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> That's why you guys are going to be firefighters. I roll with some firefighters, too. They're great. And, uh, yeah, man, I got so much respect for anybody in that first responder world. It's I wish everybody was forced at some point to serve something other than themselves, even for a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would make a difference. I I've think been, the I've been asked. Would be higher. I've been asked, like, what do you think about everybody? Like Israel, everybody has to serve in the military. I don't think that's a good idea. You know, some people. I, I think, I think mandatory service would be great, but it doesn't. I don't think it should have to be the military. Yeah. go be at the Peace Corps. Go yeah. work for the Red Cross, but go work somewhere not where you live. That's bigger than yourself. Correct. And, yeah. you, and I would like them to do it not where they live if they could, so that you could get a broader perspective and context. And you know, the people that I hear complaining the most about our society. I would like to take them on a tour of Baghdad. Yeah. Or you want to see how bad it is? Go, go for a walk with me up here in Konar. Like and or let's yeah. go down to you know, to Kandahar and let's just let's go walk around. You wanna talk about You wanna see how the other half lives? Yeah. You don't you wanna talk about how th- shitty things are while you're holding a thousand dollar fucking cell phone that has <laughs> unlimited information. Yeah. And you just paid eight dollars for a fucking latte and your hipster well, that's fuck I'm gonna say it. Hipster jeans. I'm not necessarily just talking about hipsters. Skinny jeans? Yeah, it was a broad, it was a broad statement. People, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those jeans. But the person that I'm mad about in my mind is wearing them currently, so there's nothing wrong with that. I won't judge you externally if you wear those, but I will say something to myself. No, it, the context it gives it, it it helps in my yeah. opinion. It helps, and it, I think it would it wouldn't solve any problems here, but I think it would increase appreciation, which would increase empathy. Yeah, which would help in the journey to solving the problems. I mean, if you think about it, like. What, what was it like after September 11th? You remember how everybody was like, one September team, one fight? September 12th was an interesting. Yeah, I, I thought about that, those times often. I would never, and I've heard other people say this, I would never want another I September want 11th. I like that to happen. But I certainly would appreciate society going back to what it was like on September 12th. Yep. Because I think it lasted, I would say, two to three weeks max. Now, there was a lot of American flags on rolling on cars. Dude, I was living I, in San Diego at the time. Yeah. Every overpass on like the 15, the 8, the yeah. 5, <laughs> flags on yep. every single one. Yep. And you could just, you know, I remember being in a grocery store and people were friendlier. Yeah. They, excuse me, please, thank you. And not that those are like crazy uncommon to hear, but I heard it a lot more. I heard it enough. I heard it more enough that it registered with me. This is different. And you still remember it. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish it would go back to that. And maybe that's what's going to take is just the pendulum swinging. I just hope that your occupation is not vilified and destroyed along the way because people who think they try. That getting rid of the cops is a good idea are, in my opinion, out of their fucking mind. I think we saw pretty clear what happened up in Seattle in their little autonomous zone. The por- I was reading the Portland about Portland today. It's like 63 straight days of rioting. But yeah, yeah the CHOP zone is another, uh, or Chaz or whatever they call it. Whatever they decided at the end of it. It just set up like walls and ID into, checks and it yeah. just descended into chaos. And Rapidly. You got people sh- acting, playing cop and freaking shooting people when they have two homicides in there. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. This is what happens. So you, how long have you been an officer now? 14? 13 years. 13 years? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll ask you the same question I asked you about the drug stuff. If you could get into a place where, you, you know, Nick is king for a day and you're going to write policy, what would you change about the occupation? Hmm... I th- I've seen it. I've seen it turn towards. And this sounds bad. I've seen a lot of cops, new guys, being taught to not engage. Almost here's here here it is. You got people coming into a job that requires you to watch every aspect of somebody's body, their eyes, their hands, and being able to conversate and talk. And a lot of these guys are being taught in the academy how to do that for the very first time. I think that, and maybe it makes it sound old, like we're all old because- I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah, and it's fucking cell phones. I was just gonna hold it up, yeah. Yep. Their interactions, I watch my own children, their interactions are largely over social media networks. Yeah. But I don't think those interactions make you a better communicator. You're certainly not no. reading anybody's emotions on Snapchat. Right. You know, it. It. that's, 
you've got to be able Fuck, in that's this, an interesting thing you've got to be able in this job to know and by looking somebody in the eyes going no okay we're gonna fight or not and now his eyes dart towards the door and you know all right he's going yeah you know and they they're sitting there just kind of staring and not talking it's like dude engage you know my yeah. brother's an fto right now and he's telling me he gets trainees and he's like you have to talk to these guys ask him anything ask him what his favorite team is do something and you got guys just kind of standing there the guy who got me into uh jiu-jitsu local sheriff and uh he is like the nicest dude in the world. I mm-hmm. think he has the perfect cop personality. Yeah. Because he could fucking sell ice cubes to Eskimos. Is he? Is he he's uh, just like friendly, but, you know, he could like, hey, partner, what's going on? Like he can approach the situation and just like, boom, de-escalating I, it with his words. He every can, department has yeah. one of those. And one of my buddies, <laughs> one of my buddies, I used to call him the mayor of the world. Yeah. You know, because that's how he was. He could just walk, hey, everybody. But and that's so just, cool, though. Yeah. And it, I mean. I, I think of my own kids. I like I say one of my oldest kids is having an emotional snap. He's the guy I want to show up. Yeah. Who can be like, hey man, you know, it, we're gonna get through today. What well, it's yeah. you know all of that stuff. It that's. But he probably came out of the box like that. I suspect he did. Yeah. He's a unique one. But you could you could teach that. But it's gonna you be tough if you're you, only starting to learn that in your late teens, early twenties. That's tough. Yeah. And how do you how do you talk a problem down? You know, I don't know how many times I've stopped a fight by just telling a guy, if you run or fight, like you're going to the hospital. Yeah. No running, no fighting. All right. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just being able to tell him, look, this is what's going to happen, dude. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's just a lot of people that don't. I'm seeing it now more so. A lot of people are having a hard time uh, engaging with people and that they can essentially talk down. You know, it's. We should avoid violence at all costs until we it's should. time for violence, and then you need to fucking win. And then you know need to know when to turn it off. Yeah, that's one hundred percent correct. Yeah, because it can go too far. And in your yep. and, and, like we open with, I think you absolutely have to respect the occupation. You have authority to use violence at times, and it should be respected. Yeah, it should absolutely hey, be respected. This is what I've always said: do it hard, do it fast, get it done with. If yeah. you have to use force, don't don't sit there and dance with them. Use it hard, use it fast. Put them in handcuffs. That's it. We're done. Yeah. You know? How was it? Uh, I know you got a word from Trump. How was meeting him? Yeah. Oh, he's he's a cool dude. Yeah, Where, how did that end up playing out? Did you go out to uh, D.C.? Yeah, we went to the White House. Yeah, so a group of group of guys that were involved in the shooting. Um, we all went out to the White House and put us up in a nice hotel, went over there, gave us the Forrest Gump uh, dinner. and the... <laughs> <laughs> Dude, my, my, my boy was, oh, what is this, two years ago now? See, so he was like 10. He was like Forrest Gump, dude. He's walking around with a glass Dr. Pepper bottle, and he's like, I'm going to go use the bathroom. I'm like, well, let me walk you down there. He goes, no, no, where it's at. He just walks down the stairs, goes in the library, goes to the bathroom, and he's like, hey, I saw George Washington's sword, and he just goes back to the table to start getting some more stuff in the state dining room. But yeah, no, it was was awesome, dude. They uh, they were really nice to us, and uh, it was a nice ceremony in the the East Room, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, all the dudes that were out there that were in the shooting with me. Uh, you all should have got the same damn medal because they're all freaking heroes and they're bad dudes. Yeah. You know, um, there was just a few of us that got it. And, hey. That shit happens in the military, too. Yeah. I mean, the number of people that, you know, were involved in valorous events and there's, like, a guy highlighted because of either rank or positions. Yeah. I mean, it happens. It sucks, yeah. but they know what they did. Yeah. It doesn't make it any easier, you know, but. No. And they were they're freaking heroes or warriors. And when they, you know, get into gunfight and they stood up and they fought just as hard as any of us that got a medal did. Yeah. You know, um, it's hard to run into gunfire. It just takes a different type of person to... Your body's not wired to do it. It's something no. you have to teach. Yeah. And thank God, you know, and you're saying do some, serve something bigger than yourself, you know. Thank God I had that Marine Corps training. Yeah. Because I just, I, it's, I never thought of anything else other than, okay, shoot, move, do this, do that. It was yeah. really all I was thinking. Simple is what works in a firefight, though. Yeah. Yeah. Get up, stupid. You know? Yeah. I'm up. He sees me. I'm down. Yeah. I mean, dude, we, six to eight feet sometimes, six to eight feet. Yeah. Or, you know, the, the fighting element in the SEAL team is just two minimum fighting element. One's cover and move. Yep. Hey, bang, bang, bang. I'm run. going now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no more bang. I'm down. Yeah. Bang, bang, bang. You run. And it's like, let's just do this until we can get behind something yeah. that stops bullets. Yeah. And yeah. it was, it was just that whole thing. I'm, I'm glad I didn't get tunnel vision because I know I'd always heard, you know, some people get tunnel vision. I was like, I saw everything. Oh, you know, those broad prescriptions, I find them to be pretty inaccurate. There are people who, and well, you, what I will say is this too. In my own experience, sometimes I would, and sometimes I wouldn't. Yeah. It was never like, I don't get tunnel vision. It's like, well, that time I didn't get tunnel vision. There's yeah. been times where I did get, you know, audio exclusion where I was shooting 
unsuppressed without ear pro. And I'm like, my ears aren't ringing. And then other times I'm like, God, fucking damn it. <laughs> I can't hear anything. I'm not going to be able to hear for a week after this one. Yeah. yeah. People are, you know, it should. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with the amount of probably stress and processing power you have available to you at that moment. If you got a lot of shit in your personal life coming into it, maybe you get tunnel vision easier. If you're yeah. just more over. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm totally talking out of my ass by saying that. But do you, do you ever when you're in a gunfight, anything ever slow down? The only time anything ever slowed was right after I got shot. It seemed like it took a yeah. long time for me to go from vertical to horizontal. Yeah. And as I was under the car, the the muzzle flash was slower. I would say, looking back at it, and now it's I mean, this happened in 2005, so it's been a while. I would say that time slowed for probably somewhere between five to seven seconds. Okay. But it felt like a long time. It felt like a long yeah. time, and I was under the car looking at the muzzle flash as it started to come back to its normal pace, like boom, and I'd see the flash, and it was like boom, 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 and it was like right back into okay. it. That's the only yeah. time I've ever had any sensation of time slowing. You know, in my thing, uh, it was the only thing that slowed down is when he left the car and started flanking. Interesting. It looked like he was moving in slow moving motion. Moving in slow motion, and I think that was my mind registering with my eyes. He's flanking him. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was the only time. I just I was curious. I and again, I'm, I think the individuals all, often will vary. And it's uh, there was who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody about you know there used to be st- statistics thrown out like eighty percent of people in you know in combat don't actually shoot this that or the other. And I I don't like the stats because I for one I uh, the person who I think was gathering those stats was full of shit. <laughs> but two, I know people who have been very brave in certain moments and then yeah. had moments where they weren't brave but then mm-hmm. they would have moments where they were brave again so asking somebody hey did you shoot your weapon one time is not a true indication of their performance overall overall yeah. because there have been times where people shot didn't shoot but then fuck they went and got the medal of honor yeah two weeks later you know it's like well that's the same you know what i mean so the stat those broad stats i just i find them to be inaccurate yeah yeah uh i mean same goes for police work too i don't know where i've heard that too about only x number of cops uh, yeah. ever fire their weapon and you know x number of cops some go through without ever having to pull their gun out or say i'd know, imagine those, most have to clear leather at uh, some like, point dude, but dude, it, it was almost nightly you're clearing yeah. a house you're you're yeah you know doing something it's not always pointing a gun at a person but correct but having I mean, it out when you need it or before you need it is generally yeah. considered a good idea walking through the dark <laughs> looking for a bad guy and the gun's not in the holster <laughs> for know? sure but Dude, yep. your story was amazing, man. I can't Thanks, thank man. you enough for coming out and talking openly about it and the impact that it had on you. No, I appreciate it. I'm glad you got a good platform to do this. I, yeah. I started listening to it. Oh, shoot. I don't know. I first heard you on uh, on uh, Dakotas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even realize you had your own podcast because I don't have social media. Perfect. And then I You're think, living a better life. I think Rogan <laughs> said something. I was listening to Rogan, and he said, you had a podcast, and I was like, yeah. oh, shit, I, I missed all these. I started podcast because Joe was like, hey, you should start a podcast. So. Yeah. And so I started looking out, and I think the first episode that I listened to is when you had, uh, uh, what's his name, Gallagher? Eddie Gallagher. Yeah. Yep. And I listened to that one. I was like, holy shit, you guys went pretty deep on that one. We did, and we had met, um, similar to us sitting down having this conversation, I met you down on the street, and he literally opened the door to a hotel room, and we sat down and started yeah. talking. But this shared experiences, I think, really helps when it comes to talking about that stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like the fact we both got shot in the same leg. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <is> ridiculous. <laughs> and we both- Bullet buddies. And we both immediately thought, I'm dead. Yeah. I, before I hit the ground, I had that thought, I'm going to bleed out into my pelvic girdle and into my quad. Yeah. Because I don't know how many times when we were doing like live tissue training, you can bleed yeah. out into your quad. You can bleed out into your quad. I'm like, oh, that sounds horrendous. And the yeah. next thing you know, I'm like, fuck. I'm going to bleed out into my quad. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, so. for, that's like I said, that was the first thing I thought, my femoral. Yeah. You know, that, that's crazy. It yeah. is. I, Indeed. I, I was, uh, like I always say, it was a good gunfight. It was a good day. A good day and a bad day. Worst day and best day of my life. You know? Yeah. Because I guess, you know, I, and I heard you talking about it recently. Something about going toe to toe. Like you were saying. Talking about killing people. Yeah. Yeah. When you, when you win, you know. It feels awesome. Yeah. When you're able to wipe people off the chessboard who are hell-bent on either injuring, hurting, killing other people, it feels good. Yeah. It feels like you actually made a difference. Yeah. Goodbye. I mean, imagine what would have happened if, you know, they had gone to the college. Like, Jesus. Or if they- You know, they were driving around for almost three hours. Well, thank God they had a shitty plan that kept them 
somewhat proximal to but that. But they're still rolling around in a fucking armory. I mean, imagine you know? if they would have changed their mind, like, hey, let's let, let's go hit up that JC. And, and they were gonna they were gonna go around, and we we followed them. We have them on uh, yeah. pings and towers and and pull cams and you know all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, they circled around uh, Citrus Plaza and Redlands, which is a big shopping center. Yeah, um, they were just hot lapping it. That's like, there's only dude, one way to, secondary. There's only one way to solve that problem, and it for people who say that it doesn't feel good, I'm not going to call them a liar, but I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't feel good. It feels fucking awesome. Yeah, I fucking won. I went. I played yeah. the 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 game that has the most consequences you could possibly play, and I and I won. Yeah, it made a difference. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. It yeah, is. Yeah. I, I tell you what, man, maybe, maybe can close with this, but don't lose hope. There's a huge group of people in society that have still the same amount of love and respect and admiration. You may oh, not sure. hear it right now. We don't hear it. I know it. Yeah. You can see it, and especially in the city that I work now. Yep. Uh, they, you know, they'll come out and do a counter protest to whatever's going out in front of our station. Yep. You know what I mean? But it even you goes know. beyond that. I think most of the time it's the silent majority. And yeah. of course you won't hear from them because they're you know, really practice with silent. But there's the support out there. You guys yeah. have, have a difficult job, but there's plenty of people out there who have your back. So yeah. I appreciate no, we appreciate it. Yeah. Like I appreciate said, everything you guys do. Yeah, hopefully everybody knows there's still there's still dudes that will run into gunfire in this profession. And and it's I'd say a majority of them, you know. So yeah. we can't all slap them with some label and say that they're bad and demonize them, you know. They're, they're still here to do, to help. I do agree. something good. So. Hell yeah, man. That's a perfect ending. All right.